Welcome to 132 Problems Revisiting Mormon Polygamy, where we explore the scriptural, theological, and historical evidence for plural marriage. I am so excited to be bringing you my third conversation with Don Bradley. I have to say in all sincerity that every time I engage with Don, I just like him more and more. I think so highly of him and have so much respect and appreciation for him, especially the way he handled some tri tricky things that happened when we were engaging this conversation. Thank you again, Don. And um, I want to remind everybody about the website, 132problems.org, where you can go find all of the um, transcripts, the searchable um, resources and the evidence and the sources, everything should be there. I also want to encourage Encourage people to check out the blog and the forum. That'll be a great place to be able to discuss all of these different things that we are talking about. Also, I want to reach out and encourage content creators, whether you have written papers or you have a blog or um, a book or whatever it may be, or if you have a podcast or your own YouTube channel, please reach out to us so that we can um, add those to the resources on the website. I think it will be a great um, just gathering place for people in our community to be able to go see what great content there is available for them to learn more about these topics. And now back to the conversation about Don. This is our conversation about the scriptures and the theology of polygamy. It's based in large part on the anniversary episode I released where I tried to just lay as much out as possible about the scriptural case of polygamy. And so that's what we engage in. We're going to get to the historical sources going forward in our next two conversations that we have planned so far. So I really appreciate these conversations that we are having. I think they are extremely important. I appreciate Don's willingness to talk about these things and to be open. And I know that there are some delicate things we're talking about here, but I think it's very worthwhile. I want to let you know this. Um, I compared this conversation to a soccer game for my husband. He's a big soccer fan. And you uh, soccer games last a long time. You watch for a long time and not that much seems to be happening. And then all of a sudden, like the adrenaline is pumping and it's so exciting. And that's how this conversation felt. It's quite long, but I think it is worth every minute. There are parts that are so exciting. So I hope that you will engage and enjoy it as much as I did. I hope that Don did as well. And um, I also want to thank all of those who have contributed to this podcast. Please consider doing that if you are at all able. It is very helpful for all of the things we're trying to accomplish. So with that being said, Thank you so much for joining us as Don and I take this deep dive into the murky waters of Mormon polygamy. Welcome to 132 Problems. I am so happy to be here for my third conversation with my friend Don Bradley. And I'm so thankful that he is here to speak to me again and for this ongoing series of conversations that we are engaging in. I'm hoping that we will continue to both learn a lot and that those of you listening will also be able to glean a lot from these conversations. So welcome, Don, and thank you so much for coming back again. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you so much for having me on again. Yes, it is my pleasure, definitely. Um, so Don and I, as we've been, we've we've had far more conversations on the phone that we've that we've had um, in front of the camera, <laughs> and as we've tried to structure what the, how these conversations could go, I think what we talked about talking um, what we talked about this time is that since I had recently laid out sort of my. I guess we can say my scriptural thesis of polygamy in the anniversary episode, episode 107, for anyone who hasn't seen it, that um, I asked Don if he, well, because he kind of asked me where I was coming from and why I see it this way. So I suggested that maybe he could watch that and then we could kind of discuss his views on that. I could answer questions that he could poke at it. I could ask questions and we could kind of start start at that place. And so I think that that's where we're, we're going to go. Is it, Do I have that right, Don? Are you? Yes, we're on the same pitch. Perfect. Okay. So Don, do you want to like kind of let me know? I can, I can spell out some of the things I proposed in that episode, or you can go ahead and tell me some of your thoughts. Maybe, you know, I'd be interested in maybe just giving some initial overall thoughts and then maybe having you, Michelle, go into some of the specifics and we can dialogue about those that would be great i would be very i'm i'm, I'm eager for this conversation i yes yeah. so that'll be so, great so um as i watched your anniversary episode um where you talked a great deal did a great deal of analysis on different passages from the scriptures from the bible and from latter-day saint scripture 
Um, I picked up definitely some overall themes, right? I mean, just that you start out and you've got at the creation, you know, how does God create human beings? Well, he creates them in a pair, right? This is the, the Genesis creation account, right? Has God creating Adam and Eve. So you, and, and then they're, they're married to each other in the Garden of Eden, right? And so you have uh, starting things out with one man, one woman. And then you look at from there, like different ways that this is sort of reiterated, right? So Adam and Eve's children pair off two by two. Um, Noah has, it's Noah and his wife, and then his three sons, each with their wife. So the scriptures talk about there being eight souls on the ark. So we know they, the sons each have one wife, right? And then you talk about, you know, so where does polygamy, if this is how God starts things in Genesis, then where does polygamy come from? You point to uh, the first polygamist mentioned in the Bible being, I believe, Lamech or Lamech. However, Lamech. Uh -huh. I say Lamech. Maybe some Lamech people say Lamech, Lamech. I say Lamech. So, mm -hmm. um, and so since Lamech is a, he's a bad dude, right? He, he commits murder, right? Um, then. He, he you know, covenants with Satan in the similar way that Cain right. is. Right. So, so yes. in the book of Moses, right? It, it gives more detail on that, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, since he's the first one who's mentioned as having multiple wives, he's mentioned as having two wives. Then you connect that with the, the powers of darkness. And then looking forward in the Bible, like you look at, you know, different biblical figures and were they monogamous or polygamous and um, were there, were there, if, where they were polygamous, were those happy marriages? Were they, you know, things we would want to emulate ourselves in our lives? And it, you know, like looks generally like not, <laughs> you know. And, well, and can I add one, one, yeah. one element to that as well? I also ask the question of, can these polygamists be used to justify the Mormon theological approach oh, sure. to polygamy, right? Because mm -hmm. right? that's, I think, the, the bigger question okay. is, right. they are the ones that are used to justify, even according to 132, right? right. And, then, and, then, and then the claim is made that God commanded all of their polygamy right. and that God continues to command polygamy. Right. So I think it goes deeper than just, are those cautionary tales or, you know, are they proscriptive or descriptive? Yeah. Right, right. Right, right, right. Okay. Right. So, so Mormon polygamy takes a certain form and it's not just a cultural practice. It's seen as a commandment and a theological requirement, like a requirement for exaltation. So then you're looking at do the biblical narratives that are referenced in that story. And like in DNC 132, do they bear that story, that theological story of Mormon polygamy? Do they bear that story up? or not, mm -hmm. right? And so you're finding holes, yeah. right? Where they don't, the, those stories don't align with, or they're not good supports for the story that they're used to support later. Um, and then like turning, um, I saw in particular to the Book of Mormon, because it's so unambiguous regarding polygamy and Jacob too is so strenuous on that subject, right? Uh, like I, I saw a great emphasis on that and that's one where we'll want to get into the details, obviously, of the text later. Um, but just, but that that was maybe the part in what you presented where, and maybe maybe this is just my perception, um, where maybe it seems to me like maybe you were kind of most impassioned, right? When you talked about like Jacob II and here, what, what I saw and what I heard um, is that, you are looking at how in this passage, the Lord is, he's protecting these women, right? The women are being misused, abused by the men among the Nephites who want these many wives and concubines, right? And so the Lord is saying like, I won't, like I, um, I will not suffer, right? That the men of my people will lead away captive the daughters of my people because of their tenderness Right, the Lord says, "I delight in the chastity of women," and He there's this clearly protective role that the Lord is taking here. And so, part of what I got from what you're saying was, I you know, think you, you talked about like our heavenly Father loves His daughters, right? And um, so, so for thinking of God, right, like in 
a heavenly father, right? So there's a there's a, a masculinity there that that protects. It values women and it protects. Oh, that's an interesting. I, I was going to say I kind of like how you're using the word protects because I that's not I hadn't thought of it in that way. But I, mm. I like what you're saying. I I do think of God as both male and female, as both father right. and mother. Right. And so so I think that both like like God includes both right. the feminine and, and, and I masculine. Do too. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, which is actually a question that I wanted to bring up. So there we go. Um, but, Should we just uh, go there now, and then we, or yeah, you continue. Yeah. 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 So, um, so in so that that's good to know, and we're definitely on the same page there. In in what you had been talking about in that episode, I I heard you, uh, and we can come back to Mother in Heaven, but I heard you specifically talking about Heavenly Father loves His daughters, and so in, in that frame, I'm seeing, and in Jacob too, like. Uh, is talking about God there, the Lord, right? It's talking about he. So there uh, I'm seeing like a, like kind of a protective masculinity, masculinity doing what it's actually supposed to do and protecting rather than masculinity doing what it's not supposed to do and abusing and harming, which is what the Lord is trying to protect against in that passage. Okay, yeah. And, and so um, I very much thought that your sort of vibe on that, so to speak, is actually the same vibe that's in the passage itself, that there there is that strong value placed on women and there is that strong protection that's being exercised on behalf of women. And so protection from male, you know, in, in the context of that passage, right, like um, sort of lust driven male abuses of women. And so um, and then, um, I saw when you're talking about like in the Doctrine and Covenants, right, you talked about, and we can go into all these in more detail. I'm just sort of giving overview of some of the things, um, that I noted the, um, that the article on marriage, the original section 101 in the Doctrine and Covenants was, like an, an official statement, right? And a canonized statement of the church saying in 1835, you know, we believe in one man having one wife and one woman having one husband, right? Monogamy, right? Mm -hmm. And then it gets replaced later when they, when it's decanonized, it gets replaced with DNC 132. And you talked extensively about like really sort of troubling language in DNC 132 where it adopts a very threatening tone and it speaks of women being taken from one man given to another as if the women were belongings property rather than human beings with agency and then looking of course also at um, which, which is jarring to read right and particularly I think if you look at the elect lady revelation for Emma, previous revelation for Emma, the tone is so opposite, right? She's addressed by God as my daughter, right? She's she's given the title of elect lady. She's told that she would be ordained under justice hand to exhort the church and expound the scriptures as it would be given her by God's spirit. And so then to see the same woman addressed in such a different register altogether in DNC 132 where there are threats of destruction and and so on is is really troubling and it's such a stark contrast and so um so I kind of just overall I saw this um you laying out that you know the the scriptures with beginning with genesis appear to establish a kind of default monogamy right that the first couple the first humans created it's monogamy right and then sort of moving from there to show a consistency across the scriptures and um to argue against you know claims that polygamy as it appears in the bible is a good support for early the early polygamy as taught and practiced by early Latter-day Saints. And then you're pointing out just various real ethical issues in 
Mormon polygamy, right, where there was like a lack of consent um, or, or, or a very incomplete consent if, if a woman's, you know, she's told, she's asked to give her consent, but then her consent can be overridden or um, like women um, are talked about in like property language and so on, just things that obviously are deeply problematic. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you hit on a lot of what I talked about. I would always frame it somewhat differently, but I think you did a really good job of encapsulating many of those arguments. That's, okay. Yeah. There's, there's more to it from my perspective, but yes, I, I'm very satisfied. I'm like, oh, well done, Don. You... Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. So I wanted to make sure up front that I wanted to communicate kind of an overall gist of sort of what I understood. And then Mm -hmm. like uh, as sort of a prelude maybe to talking about some specifics and to communicate that I like I I do understand and I see right like the why some of the things in I absolutely understand why as we talked about previously like much that was in early Mormon polygamy like would be disturbing right and I think I talked about that during the period when I myself left the church, one of the things that I put in my, you know, I was out for five years and came back, but like one of the things I put in my letter resigning my membership, I put some things about polygamy, right? So this was an ethical objection that I had yeah. to um, being a Latter-day Saint, right? To, to what I understood at that time of polygamy. And um, like, I, I definitely see, you know, I, I share the same disturbance with like property language applied to human beings, right? And I share the same sense that um, you know masculinity in its at its best is protective. Obviously, like like it's supposed to be the opposite of abusive, right? And so, yeah. And um, I like that. I wanted to clarify that one point because um, because I don't I I actually really liked your dichotomy between the masculine either protecting or abusing, you know. Yeah. But I definitely, as a mom, or like there is a feminine protectiveness. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. So I don't think yeah. it's it's strictly a male role. I just wanted it's to clarify absolutely that. Absolutely not. And and I think yeah. And I I agree with you. So I. Um, I mean, um, the, the most, one of the most famous, um, examples of protectiveness is a mama bear, right? Right, right, right. You, yeah. You, you don't, you don't mess with the mama bear, right? So right. For the protection of children, right. And even our grown children, right. We, we still feel protective over. And so obviously like, um, if one were living in a polygamous culture and had daughters, right. I'm certain that like, uh, protective instinct would kick in very strongly. The um, protective instinct of mothers has to be crushed in polygamy. And I think that's actually harder to do than the protective instinct of fathers often. Fathers often are happy to trade away their daughters for their own glory. And I think it crushes the mother's hearts often because yeah. they know what's in store for their daughter. So anyway, that was just, since we went on this sidetrack, I'll just throw that in there, that I do think that actually, you know, fathers are the big strong ones that can be the active, don't mess with me. But right. I think that mothers have an innate, um, like the protective instinct of a mother holding her babies in her arms no, has no parallel. <laughs> right, 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 right. So, right. yeah. Right. So if we think, absolutely. And so if we think about, I mean, I, I was blessed. Sorry. Well, um, I was blessed to have a truly amazing mother. Um, and so I see that absolutely. Um, so, um, like I can only imagine, right, that a divine mother, right, or heavenly mother, would have like a deep protectiveness, a deep concern, right, a, such a deep love for her children, right, and that, you know, her daughters being like images of her, right. Um, like there would be a particular connection there uh, that can be like extremely um, nurturing and empowering. And so um, I, I do, I'd be interested actually in seeing more discussion. I'm not saying from you in particular, I just, just a 
a thought of mine, more discussion of like mother in heaven um, and sort of our relationship to mother in heaven and then how that might factor into people's discussions about doctrines like polygamy or ideas and practices like polygamy, right? Because yeah, we do, I, yeah, go ahead. I tend to agree with you very strongly. I'll let you finish your sentence and then I'll respond. I didn't Yeah, because um, we talk in the restoration, like in the restoration we're blessed with a doctrine of a divine feminine, a doctrine of a heavenly mother. I think that like most of the Christian world is kind of, much of the Christian world, let me say it that way, is seeking that now. They're thinking, well, we've always talked about God in masculine terms. Where's where's the mother and where's the feminine? And so they're having to try to look really hard to find a divine mother or in some ways kind of create a notion of a divine mother. Whereas for Latter-day Saints, this has been in our understanding since the time of Joseph Smith. And so like, we just haven't, fleshed it out very much. We don't talk about it very much. And so in these discussions about polygamy, I think that could, that's probably particularly galling for women, I would think, right? Because like the idea is, well, you're, you're, that people are being told like, well, your father in heaven is requiring you, woman, women, right? To like share your husbands forever and we know that that's the case because like we have certain male general authorities who have said so in the past or, or, or present. And we have maybe sort of like male scholars who've said so. And so the whole thing sounds like a, a giant patriarchal structure from the way that it's described from God on, right, on down, right, to... Do you, do you see what I'm saying? I, I would. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Um, I mean, I mean, we're kind of, we can, we can talk about this topic. You know, I, I'm kind of curious to know what questions you have. I definitely, my patriarchal blessing does mention the relationship I would develop with my heavenly mother. It mentions that both with, with every member of the Godhead and includes heavenly, it says, my relationship I would develop with my heavenly mother. So I haven't felt that same, um, I guess, bar, like that's mm -hmm. not allowed. Although yeah. I think we are all raised in this. And, and I've talked to many other women and, you know, women, and it kind of doesn't bother you until it bothers you. You're yeah. oblivious to it until all of a sudden yeah. you're smacked in the face by it somehow right. for some reason, or just, it just happens, you know? And, um, and I can remember like some of the cases where that happened, where it's like, I realized there was not feminine, but I was a grown woman with many children when that happened, you know? Right. And so I do think that, um, I don't, I don't know that everyone can relate to, oh, this is a problem for me. I know some people do. And then it's hard for people who haven't experienced that to be sympathetic with mm -hmm. it, you yeah. know, but I, I do, I do definitely, I, um, like, I know it's a confusing issue because in polygamy, the the first that I'm aware of, like explicit statement of Heavenly Mother was Eliza Snow in, you know, mm -hmm. what has became the hymn, Oh My Father, right? Mm -hmm. And it talks about a Heavenly Mother explicitly, but it talks about a Heavenly Mother, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. But but I think the idea of the feminine divine is much, much older. It stems all the way back mm -hmm. to Genesis, mm -hmm. our creation story, male right. and female, in the, in the image of God. God right. created male and female, right? right? And so we know that God, right from, right from the beginning, it contains male and female. Right. God's and image is female and female, right? Right, right. So we know that God is male and female. And it's not that male is the default and female is the other. Right. It's, right. it's, it's the per two halves of a whole, right? right. That creates God. Right. And so I do think that right. we are missing something when it skews too far into the silencing of woman and valuing of male right. when, when it's not um, more, when they're both not equally valued and represented and heard, exactly. we, we get problems. So right. yeah, so that's my thoughts on that. But yeah. I don't so, know if so when they're sort of, when they're sort of, when they're out of balance, you might say when the masculine right. and feminine are put, they're meant to be in balance, right? And this is in Genesis, right? Like, like yeah. you're saying, they're created in the image of God, which is plural there, Elohim, right? male and female so what does that say about god right right male and exactly. female have a divine masculine and divine feminine and they are co-creating they're co-creating yes. they co-create this this three female beings cannot create children 
ever, right? We can't have God the Father, right. Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost as three males that create right. mankind. It doesn't right. work that way. Right. And right. I'm not saying that God creates us sexually. I'm not getting into any of that. I'm right. just saying we are obviously missing parts of this that we haven't that that people haven't thought through well. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. And so the, yeah, the fact that there is in the, on the divine level, there's that balance and there's that co-creation suggests that that's what's supposed to be happening on our level, right? That's a model yeah. for us. Yes. And I, I and guess, can I, oh, go ahead. Can yeah. I quickly throw out there yeah. for people yeah. love to call me a feminist. And I think that's funny in so many ways. First of all, they mean it purely as an insult. And I know a lot of people who wear that name proudly. Yeah. I'm not. And I think it's so funny. I am a mother of 13 who has spent my entire life raising my family and homeschooling my family. I even dropped out of a full scholarship at BYU to have my baby and not, you know, like, yeah. not, I mean, I've always counted that as like, Look at my motherhood stripes. I sac I've sacrificed everything for motherhood, right? And so right. I just want to throw out for people that equality doesn't have to mean sameness. I don't want right. to prescribe roles. I'm just, these are the ones that worked beautifully for us. I have loved being a mom, right? So I wanted to throw that out that I'm not calling for, I, I just, people get so, they just yeah. are determined to accuse me of everything. So anyway, I, yeah. I had to include that in there that yes, I think equality is, is important, however that looks in people's individual families and however that looks in society it doesn't have to mean sameness right it doesn't have to mean that it has to mean equal the respect right. yeah equal respect yeah. equal honor actually one of my big problems with the feminist movement is i feel like they've spent far too long saying look women are just as good at being men as men are be as right. men are which i think is the wrong way to go i think it should be look the feminine the traditional feminine role is just as important as the traditional masculine role. That's, mm -hmm. that's how I would approach it. Right. So, okay, sure. continue. Right. <laughs> to bring the two into balance so, and, yes. and that they're complementary, they synergize with each other. That's how it's meant to be. So one, I guess a question that has, I guess kind of implicitly come up, but I would like to ask you in particular, and then go maybe back into the, the specific scriptures, maybe as like like you laying out more of your understanding about them, and we can dialogue about them. Um, so, do you think so? Kind of the scenario that I had in my mind earlier. Um, I'm wondering, not being a Latter Day Saint woman, right? Myself, um, I'm wondering to what extent. In these discussions about polygamy, I'm wondering how much it's galling or difficult for Latter-day Saint women that um, it's not, th there, there's the actual facts of how Mormon polygamy was practiced and the, the pain involved in that and the inequality, right? And then there's also the fact that when modern well, at that time and now, um, women were being told that polygamy was commanded and polygamy was necessary. It was necessary for them to share their husband. And who are they being told this by? They're being told it by men. Right? Okay. They're being okay. told it by um, men who, when polygamy was being practiced, let's say in Utah, right? Um, in the 19th century, it was the ones who, whom polygamy put in a more one-up, more powerful position, who were the very ones advocating polygamy and saying to the women, you have to do this. And then the way that we've tended as Latter Saints to talk about God, even though we do have a divine feminine, because there hasn't been a sort of balance in our, how we talk about them, um, that, Basically, women were told and, and maybe are told in terms of like eternal polygamy and so on, that like the your, your like God conceived in masculine terms is telling you that you have to share your husband and you're being told this through male leaders. Does that that seems to me okay. like it sort of adds insult to injury, but I don't so, so I'm. 
Yeah. So, so for me, so I absolutely hear what you're saying. I do think that there is a huge problem. Poly well, there are many ways I could address this. Polygamy always has been that. It's always the king that has all of the wives. It's the most powerful man that has all the wives. Then you have to get rid of all of the other men. Like back in the days of the kings, they would create eunuchs, right? Or they would create mm -hmm. wars. They would have ways mm -hmm. to get rid of the surplus masculine population, right? Yeah. And so what is, uh, I would say, more diabolical about Mormon polygamy is that it's not just I'm the king so I can do this. It's God, I'm doing this on behalf of God. And and Brigham Young really did turn himself into God. You know, Heber talked about how Brigham is his God and mm -hmm. and he, and each man was the God of his family. So for when a, so when a woman was yeah. told to be obedient to God, it meant be obedient to your husband and to the priesthood leader. When yeah. men were told to be obedient to God, it meant be obedient to the priesthood leader. And it's important to know that when you read their old sermons, because right. when they say things like you obey and you obey God, even if it goes against your instincts, even if it doesn't seem right, that's what that's what they were saying in those in that in those terms. Right. So I do think there's a huge problem where this actually has a more um, malignant twist to it because it's not just man is doing this and man sometimes does bad right. things. It's I'm do is it's it's taking the Lord's name in vain in the most uh, like in the most explicit way, in the worst way, saying on behalf of God, God needs you to, you know, stop your incest in your infernal whining, right? And just right. deal. Right. And so, yes, but for myself in my own journey, I actually came to all of that understanding later because I am, I, I'm, I'm weird in that for me, polygamy wasn't a feminist issue. That's not how I came to it. I mm -hmm. completely accepted it and not, and it wasn't hard for me. I thought it would be beautiful. I thought, you know, like, like I heard the stories of my grandmother and, and mm. the sister wife. And I, you know, I just thought there are things we don't understand. And I just wanted to be obedient to God. Yeah. So it was, so for me, the issue isn't um, all of those later, th all of those things about mm -hmm. the more, the more feminist approach have been later additions to me to come yes. to understand based on what God taught me about polygamy. So for me, it's just been about the truth of God more than about fighting for womanhood, if that makes sense. Sure. Okay, so I don't totally. come to it necessarily emotionally in that way. I come to it more now at this point though, I am deeply offended, deeply offended by the taking the Lord's name in vain in this way, by saying this is who God is. So it sounded before with what you were maybe asking was like, if polygamy were done better, would it be okay? If it weren't combined with sort of how it was abusive to women? And I would say, no, no. God, I, I believe to my core in the establishment of marriage that God not only describes, but proscribes. You know, it's not just right. a, a template that's laid. God does lay the template and commands the template and repeatedly commands the template again and again and again and says, this is the way that yeah. human beings join and dwell and raise families right and so so i i think that the thing that is like like i am firmly committed to that truth that i find throughout scripture and most explicitly in the book of mormon and also in the doctrine and covenants but also consistently in the bible right so i yeah. i feel like no this is the truth of god and we have to stop lying about it we have to stop mm -hmm. defending bad things because okay. of our traditions. That's okay. more how I approach okay. it. That 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 helps me understand much better. So so what I'm what I'm hearing is that um as you look so so, so yes, historically there have been practices where powerful men would make it so that they had a greater number of women, so they could monopolize Who, women more, right? Who's is, most represented in DNA in the world? I believe it's Genghis Khan. It's Genghis really Khan. Really example. For Those this reason, yeah. right? right? Like, right. like that's that's what it was. Right. Yeah. So, so that is uh, something that's happened across human history as a human doing failing, just right. like rape and has failing. happened across human history yeah. because. God in the Garden of Eden, when he tells Eve, when he warns Eve of the conditions of a fallen world, like he does to Adam and says, man will rule over you. Mm -hmm. He is not commanding the man to rule over wo the right. woman. He is warning that in a fallen world, wicked men exercise unrighteous dominion and take advantage of women. Right. right? Yeah. So yeah. That's how I see it anyway. Yeah. So, so right. It's descriptive. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So then, um, 
so the the big problem that you have then is what what kicks this up to another level for you is that you see you look through history and you see abuses like this by powerful men but then to have it attributed to god um is something that is like galling to you like disturbing that yeah. that this kind of practice would be attributed to god and you look at so the scriptures and you see a, a consistency on this subject where there's a sort of divine consistency. And so then when people are presenting polygamy as well, polygamy is God's way. Polygamy is what God commanded of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and so on. Right. And they were just following God's law and this is necessary. You have to live this way, you know, in order to, have your family forever and be like God, then that is so far from what you're seeing in the scriptures that it's just, you feel like we're like, as a sort of Mormon culture, we've like been deceiving ourselves and we need to go back to what is in the scriptures. Yeah. Yes, I do. It offends me in that way in saying this is what, who God is. I, right. I, I felt a deep repentance process to, I, I, I felt, um, it's, it, it's hard to explain. I think people will relate to this who have gone in the same way, but the fact that I thought that that's who God was, I felt that was something mm. I deeply repented of, if that makes okay. sense. Sure. And, and so I feel like in order to defend this awful doctrine of polygamy, which it's so, see, there, there are so many things I want to say. 132 offends me also intellectually because it's just so bad. Like verse one, like I've talked about often, Isaac was never a polygamist. Mm -hmm. But then we add to that, Abraham and Jacob were never commanded to practice polygamy. I, I mean, there are so many contradictions, both internally within 132 and throughout the rest of scripture that I do find it frustrating. It's like, this is bad. It's badly, it's, it's not even a good fake revelation. It's a bad fake revelation is how I look at it. We can, mm -hmm. we can look at it intellectually and just go, this is not good. Right. Mm -hmm. But then, but then on the spiritual level, much more deeply to where we, in order to protect this false tradition, we throw Joseph Smith under the bus big time. We say he did horrible things. And in addition, we throw God under the bus. We throw Emma Smith under the bus. We majorly throw Hiram Smith under the bus. We do all of this in order to protect Brigham Young, who is beyond our protection. If we just go through and read his sermons, it's pretty hard to defend many of the things that Brigham Young and, the, and many of the other early leaders said and did. It's very difficult to defend. But we don't have that same problem with Joseph and Emma and Hiram. They're not hard to defend unless we believe Brigham's narrative and Brigham's the one that said it. It's also not hard to defend God unless we believe Brigham's narrative. And so we are elevating this narrative that's based on such bad evidence. And in the process, we are saying Joseph did all of these things wrong. Emma was a crazy person that was a murderer, tried to kill her husband multiple times and much more, right? Hiram Smith was an idiot. And, oh, and by the way, God, you know, he does these things that we just don't understand. But, you know, like, like, like it's God. Who's, who are we to say what God does when they're horrible mm -hmm. things that destroy the very nature of God? That's what I find offensive. Okay. Okay. So the, Sorry, the clash, I got a little impassioned there. Sure, sure. <laughs> so, so the clash you see, so you see so much inconsistency in 132 intellectually as well as morally, like, like it's inconsistent with the biblical narratives in Genesis that you're analyzing. And then like the, the things that it attributes to God offend you morally. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And in fact, in this recent study, it was fascinating for me to find so many of Brigham's doctrines embedded into 132. For example, blood atonement. That's mm -hmm. a fascinating find that that really has given me more insight into that. I think bl blood atonement mm -hmm. is in 132. That is purely from Brigham Young, right? We can trace where that started in 1845 in, res in regard, the first time I've seen it is in regard to a mixed race marriage where he said mm -hmm. if we, they were living outside of the United States where we could get away with it, they'd have to have their blood mm -hmm. spilled. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on from there to be actually practiced in Utah 
and and the ways he talked about. I, I talk about this a little bit later in the episode, so maybe, I don't know if you got that far. But that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Yeah. That is not God. We should not be trying to defend these things. And I think we would do so much better if we just acknowledge them and repent of them and move on, looking for the better parts, the better things. Yeah. So you see more, much more beautiful things in scripture and our theology that you want us to be able to let go of sort of the dross, like refine that out so we can get to the beautiful things. Yes, and so we can add to the beautiful things, because like I also spoke about in the episode, we are told repeatedly in the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants that while we are still keeping these abominations in our back pocket, mm. we will not receive more, right? We've mm. all just settled down into this sort of self-satisfied stupor of expecting that this is exactly what it is, when the promises of the Book of Mormon are so grand right? Mm -hmm. So much has been promised to the saints if we will embrace truth and abandon abomination. And so mm -hmm. I feel like it's it's twofold. It's really, really holding us back. We're mm -hmm. so mired in our, it's, it's just explained everywhere in the Book of Mormon, right? We are so stuck in the sandy foundation and we're so busy defending false traditions that we are foregoing all of God's promises. That's mm -hmm. what I find painful. Okay, okay. 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 <laughs> Am I too much? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 no. I mean, I think that like um, the Book of Mormon definitely promises like greater things. It says that the, the, we're given the lesser things and then those are used as a trial of our faith, right? So that we can um, prove ourselves worthy of the greater things. So this would be like the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon and further scripture. And so there might be so much out there for us, awaiting us in the restoration as we, as we become prepared for it. And that, 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 I mean, that's a vision that I sympathize with completely. And to be honest with you, always have ever since I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. I, like one scripture that I go to often, and it's repeated throughout the Book of Mormon and in the Doctrine and Covenants, but I love, I love 3 Nephi 26. And um, I'll just look at verse 10, well, I, 9 and 10. And when they shall receive this, the portion we have, right? This little, this little part of it mm. that doesn't, yeah. doesn't contain a hundredth, right? Which yeah. is expedient that they should have first to try their faith. And if it so be that they shall believe these things, which we right. have not done, because the Book of Mormon is the strongest document. It's the strongest scripture against a, um, polygamy, right? So if I were the adversary, what is the thing I would do to destroy the Book of Mormon? I would bring in polygamy and pollute the Book of Mormon with polygamy so that instead of instead of actually reading the Book of Mormon, everybody just thinks of the bad things that the Mormon church did, polygamy and, abom and um, blood atonement. So they reject the Book of Mormon completely. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, if it's so if, if they shall believe these things, then shall the greater things be made manifest unto them. And if it's so be that they will not believe these things, then shall the greater things be withheld from them unto their condemnation. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's exactly where we are. We're told multiple times that this is the reality. And and I think, I, I, I do believe, I do want us to be a people who believe the Book of Mormon. I think that would be a great thing. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Okay. Um, so I guess I kind of want, like, you've done a good job describing <laughs> what I right. said, and but right. I want you to go further. I want to know. Well, I, I want to go. Into, yeah. I want to go into the meat of it. So, John, can I can I ask you first, though? Can I just ask you, like, if you I, I don't know if you were able to watch the whole video. I know it was long. <laughs> I always recommend I already speak fast, so it's hard to watch it on double speed. But I always but um, that is an option. I'm wondering what you thought. Like, would you still after watching that defend polygamy as a, a doctrine of God? So. Um... Maybe the, the okay. So the way I would approach it would be more to maybe dive into the specific scriptures, and then I can kind of lay out what I think kind of more along the way, and give a more like definite statement of that after. A more nuanced answer. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So kind of like so. So when you talk. Um, about, you know, going literally right back to the beginning, right? Adam and Eve, right? 
Uh, so I, I do see um, that, you know, looking at the biblical creation account, which is repeated right in the book of Moses and, and book of Abraham, you have a, you have one man and one woman. This certainly would suggest in that sort of biblical framework that monogamy is the default, right? And then uh, the fact that Adam and Eve's children pair off similarly, and you've got the same kind of thing, you know, a few generations later, several generations later with Noah, would that would obviously go along with the fact that men and women are born at, uh, you know, approximately equal, um, in approximately equal proportions. Um, among yeah, maybe it, did I tell you this last time? Actually, the male birth rate is slightly higher because yeah, the male infant right mortality here. rate. Sorry, yeah. I won't repeat it then. Yeah, and I just so, I like the, I like knowing that because of the argument that there would be more women in heaven. <laughs> right. So, anyway, yeah. continue. Yeah, so, so certainly, oh yeah. So certainly, one one line of um, reasoning then is well, God, you know, God appears to have made monogamy the human default based on just how He created. Adam and Eve originally in Genesis, and then how he creates, how God creates people now in approximately equal numbers. And I think, I mean, there might be, I, I, I'll, I, I, I grant that reasoning. I see that reasoning myself, right? Um, I mean, there would be further complexities about kind of like, I mean, um, the proportion of human cultures that have practiced polygyny. Um, it's, it's a high proportion of human cultures it might suggest some sort of, um, I don't know. It, it, it would be interesting to think about for me, kind of like, why do, why have human cultures tended to develop polygyny, even though yeah. humans tend to be born in approximately equal numbers with, with more male births than female births. Um, yeah. and, I, and definitely, I think that like, I, I don't know, there are- I think that, can I respond to that? Or do yeah. you want to keep- No, going? go ahead. Because I, I I won't remember the name of the study right now, but um, I'll look it up. And the people who have done it, people have actually looked into this and mm -hmm. it's been studied. There are many things that have been practiced culturally throughout time. The question is, well, I, and we can kind of figure out why. And then we should ask, is that good or is it bad? Right. Like mm -hmm. slavery is ubiquitous throughout human history. We know why it's hard to do all of work, the work that needs to be done before electricity. It's really easy for us now to be so anti-slavery. I don't I'm not talking about just American, African-American slavery. I'm talking about slavery throughout time. The reason they're called slaves is because of the Slavs. Right. And so um, so I guess the point I'm saying is, yes, we can see why slavery happened throughout time. Many, many human civilizations did it. Does that mean it's good? Right. We can look at oh, right. rape has happened throughout time. Right. Um, human sacrifice has happened. Like the thing that happens throughout time is the propensity of humans to have the powerful abuse the less powerful. Mm -hmm. That's what all of these come down to, including polygamy. Right. Mm -hmm. And so so what we should what I think is a better question is where do we find human flourishing? Well, and that's the, those are the studies mm -hmm. that have been done that have compared. Mm -hmm. So okay. societies that that um, allow polygamy to societies that don't allow polygamy. For example, oh, and I, I can't remember who did it, but I'll add, I, I'll add it. As I said, when Canada, when the Canadian Supreme Court or whatever they're called in Canada was deciding this, many studies were done and were looked at and considered and showed that universally across the board, societies that allow polygamy have worse outcomes. They're less... Um, affluent, abundant, stable, um, successful societies. They, they are not good for human flourishing. Polygamy is not good for human flourishing. So I think you add all of that. We know that fathers are important, right? Fathers are important in human development. That's shown across the board as well. And, and the more successful a polygamous man is, the less of a father his children have. So, you know, when you have men that are having hundreds of children, we have so many stories mm -hmm. of men not even knowing who their children are or were, right, or are in polygamous colonies, communities. So so on every single measure, we can look at the fruits of polygamy. We can look at God's creation and then we can look at the fruits of polygamy. It's all bad. It all points toward the the consistency of what God established and commanded. So interesting. Okay. 
So, so I guess one thing I should clarify is that, like, I'm, I'm not saying that um, polygyny has been widely practiced, therefore, um, that means it's good, right? I'm saying if, if I'm looking at just like the question of kind of like the biblical creation account setting up, well, there's, there's man and there's woman, there's a man and a woman, right? A monogamous couple. And then looking at the birth ratios, right? I'm saying in my mind that gets, that's not absolutely definitive, right? I see the consideration strongly. I'm saying it's not absolutely definitive because then I think, well, there are other sorts of complexities, like, like why has this been practiced in various human cultures? And so, for instance, if it's just a matter of power dynamics and, and polygynous marriages happen, or, or, or polygamous marriages of any kind, because there are a handful of cultures that have polyandrous marriages, right? If it's just, which wouldn't presumably be due to power dynamics, unless the women No, but they have are, different oh. dynamics. So that's also right. a very right. negative, and it's usually due to extreme poverty where there's a high bride price. So the family will buy one bride for for multiple brothers. It's it like I have from what I have seen, those are you the usual types of reasons for polyandry. Sure, sure. Those kinds of things. It, it, and it, it, it's not a it's not a flourishing system. Okay, so the um, I know that in some um, hunter-gatherer societies um, in Africa or like horticultural societies, those are actually, uh, hunter-gatherer societies are actually known for being relatively egalitarian, like less patriarchal. And yet there are great many of them that allow polygyny. And so it doesn't seem that polygyny is just a byproduct of patriarchy. Um, well Okay. Okay. I, th I think that would have to be um, investigated more. I would need to investigate that more. I know that there are a lot of claims like that, but when I have read many um, different texts, I think that we can define um, patriarchy in sort of the more biblical Western way and have it be this structural thing. But when you look at um, a lot of indigenous mm -hmm. cultures and we claim that they have this more egalitarian structure, we're ignoring things like, for example, in Africa, um, female genital mutilation, you know, or, no, so, or, or so, right. so we're not, genital we're mutilation not fully, Islamic societies, not hunter gatherer societies. Those what did are, you say? I'm sorry, say that again. Africa has an extraordinarily wide range of cultures. Female genital mutilation is happening in certain Islamic countries in North Africa. It's not a, it's not a hunter gatherer, like tribal practice. But, it, but, but I think there are things that go back a very, very long time. And we, we kind of look at them and take what we want to take from them and don't sure. look at what yeah. might actually be happening. Some of them were very violent societies and, sure. and women often were not, were treated, you know, weren't treated as well as women today would want to be treated necessarily. I don't think that we can just, as, you know, it's kind of like the, what is it called? The um, noble savage. I'm not, rem you know, it's like, oh, what sure. is our idea of nature? Is it just, oh, they were all good before there was civilization. I don't right. think that that's a fair representation. I don't think we know. But I, I kind of am curious what, like, like what your thought process is, what, well, why we're well, discussing these. Things. Right. So, so something where I would agree with you um, greatly, where I think actually we're completely on the same page, right, would be when you reference studies and you talk about looking at human flourishing, right? And so I, um, I, I'm into studies, I'm into research, I'm into understanding what's actually the case. I don't like, I'm, I don't wanna be ideological. I wanna like have my beliefs represent actual reality. And so, you know, I, I know that there is there's a lot of anthropological research right now on different societies, right? Um, and their their different forms of marriage and family, and so whatever those studies end up showing on the whole across time, right? About these different like practices and how they affect human well-being, human suffering, human flourishing, I'm completely open to taking the judgment of those studies. And, and, you know, similar things are happening in modern Western society. You have the currently kind of the rise of polyamory, which is like a sort of 
polygamy, but like on a on a very different basis where it's not based on sort of male power. You know, it's it's meant mm-hmm. to be the people practicing it are generally very liberal, right? And yeah, so it's meant to be think, egalitarian. And so so what I'm saying is just that I know we're, that and we're gonna have different perspectives on that for sure. Well, well I'm just saying I know that there are a lot of studies being done, a lot there's a lot of research being done on that right now because it's such a growing thing in American society. And so basically I'm willing to go with ultimately what, what did the studies show about what's, you know, kind of like what's good for people as far as the question of what's good for human beings. Like I'm just open to whatever the data shows. If it, if it turns out like you're saying that, um, you know, the, the weight of the evidence is that certain practices are bad for human beings, bad for human flourishing, then I wouldn't want people to have those practices. I, I don't know how much there might be individual variation on that where sort of like a, a, a family form or relationship form that might work for one person wouldn't work for another. Um, I but think there are definitely- For humans, yeah. Wait, yeah, wait. there are definitely exceptions to every rule. There's effort, definitely the individual. Everyone has to deal with their own set of circumstances. So I'm not, I'm never saying this is what everyone needs to do. I feel like the, like if we want to talk about a science that's settled, <laughs> I don't agree that the, the, the story about the Joseph Smith narrative is settled, but I do think there is so much evidence that that a family raising their children is how the best societies are created, the most stable they're established. I think that we really have to leave a lot of it, um, like we have to twist things around to pretend that there, there, there are different systems that work as well. We have to ignore a lot. We have to make it politically not correct, right? We know what establishes good families and good societies with stability, with human flourishing. That that has been known for a long time. And even if we wanna just look at the world, right? I feel like we mm-hmm. are, the beneficiaries of a great civilization that was established mm-hmm. based on the tr- the very biblical morality of a mo- mother and a father raising their children. I know that there was bad behavior, I like, but that was the um, accepted norm. That was what it was expected. If men did have affairs, they were expected to keep them quiet, right? Mm-hmm. It would not have been looked upon ha- nicely. So even if it did happen, it was not accepted is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And, and we have inherited this great civilization built on that. And now we are just like we are doing with everything else going, hey, why don't we just throw that out and throw that out and throw yeah. that out? And I think we do that at our own peril. There's the meme yeah. of the bird or of the person sitting on the twig, you know, sawing off sure. what they're attached to and what their whole foundation is. I think I think we are in peril as a society now because yeah. we're throwing out all of these things. I'm so, all for investigating them. I'm not for throwing them out. Right. And I do also take the Book of Mormon seriously, where it says in Jacob 2 and other places that cursed is the land, cursed be the land for their sakes if they mm-hmm. abandon the traditional mm-hmm. morality that God has given us, if we embrace abomination. That happened with the early church. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You can't mm-hmm. get much more cursed than they were with constant mm-hmm. plagues and famines and horrible, horrible things happening, right? Mm. And we've been doing a lot better since we've gotten rid of polygamy. I, I think that we should take those warnings seriously. I, I think the family as God established it leads to human flourishing and nothing else compares. So so you're probably familiar with the quote by G.K. Chesterton that says something like, um, never tear down a fence, never tear down a wall before you understand why it was built. Oh, I like that. Okay. So um, I'm not for just kind of like taking cultural practices of all for reasons. Those reasons are not always good. Um, We do see forms of discrimination against all different kinds of groups, you know, racial and like things that have been done to people who are LGBTQ across time and so on, right? Things that would, we would detest um, now rightly right but like in our culture as a whole like i tend to think that cultural practices evolved for a reason that they were effective at least to a certain degree and so i don't just take the view of well hey i don't know exactly why this cultural norm exists let's throw it out right i would take a more careful kind of approach and a more reasoned approach. So kind of like what you were saying, Michelle, like investigating things like, right, like not 
I definitely would not want a sort of knee-jerk reflex reaction of let's throw out let's throw out things that appear to have been working or something like that. You know, like like I would say for sure, like you know, let's get more knowledge, let's get more information about what does help with human flourishing for, for you know, various mm -hmm. people and for society as a whole, and then let's let's run with that. Okay, so, so can I, okay, I wanna narrow in on trying to understand okay. my understanding of this conversation, and you can correct me. So what I'm gathering is that maybe you're using new polyamorous forms of marriage to say that marriage as God established, it might not be as set in stone as we thought it was in order to defend that polygamy might also have fit within that category of it. I'm trying to understand how, why we're discussing polyamory in this conversation on Mormon polygamy. Like I, I, I just, maybe you're seeing a connection that I'm not fully sure. comprehending. So, so Mormon polygamy doesn't look a lot like modern polyamory. So I, no. I'm not saying traditional Mormon polygamy does look a lot like modern polyamory. On the one hand, like I'm agreeing, right? I'm, that I'm seeing something that you're seeing, right? Which is the biblical creation account, it begins, there's a man and a woman. God creates a man and a woman uh, in the divine image, right? And so on, okay. And then um, men and women are born in roughly equal ratios with actually more males born than females, right? So we agree on that. And then I'm... At, so for me, then the sort of question is, so does that sort of settle the issue, right? And I'm saying, well, there actually seem to be more complexities as you look at like what human cultures around the world have done that doesn't appear to me always to be just motivated by like, like dynamics of male power. And then I'm saying that um, I'm agreeing with you that like, like setting what actually works for human beings, how do human beings flourish, that I'm completely on board with that. So I'm basically, I'm agreeing, but saying like, there might be other considerations and maybe those considerations don't so much apply specifically to Mormon polygamy um, as they do to sort of just like um, the question of whether monogamy is kind of the abs an absolute invariant um, okay. standard. Okay, so what I'm hearing, if I'm gathering this right, is you are open to playing with marriage or to consider like 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 that to considering that monogamy might might not be the only absolute, right? Yeah, like you're open to that possibility. Right. And and right. um. So okay. However, you wouldn't think that Mormon polygamy is a model that that should should be considered in I, I guess I'm really interested because what yeah. you you're a member of the church and what yeah. the thing that people are getting mad at me about right is questioning polygamy right but yeah. I am standing for marriage I'm hearing you say no I don't think polygamy was good and I'm also not convinced that traditional marriage is the it needs to be the only absolute right like like I, I guess I'm kind of confused about um, yeah. I, I, and I, we, yeah. we definitely have all kinds of issues going on with, yeah. um, we have no good answers for gay members of the church. We just don't. We don't. It's really sad. I made a short about that a while ago because that's part mm. of my feeling is like, yeah. we're being so hypocritical and maybe we would be inspired with better answers for gay members of the church right. if we would if we would clean up our own house first so we could get better answers because how we're handling it is not working. It's not good and mm -hmm. it's creating a lot mm. of suffering needlessly. Right. Right. But I don't think we have the answers of how we can handle it as a as a people, you know. So anyway, so I, so I, I'm so sympathetic to yeah. to all of the um, all of the situations that various people yeah. that various people face in their lives, right? Yeah. And yeah. I, I just at this point don't see how um, I, I I still at this point feel like traditional marriage as God established it is important yeah. and and when we talk about polyamory and these different things what i what i think is really happening is kind of the destruction of traditional marriage mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um and i know people can argue with that but we sure have seen that happening like marriage has is, is going the way of the dodo right and i think that that's a concern mm -hmm. yeah and yeah. i think that we as mormons we as a people could 
advocate better in better ways and with less internal contradiction and hypocrisy if we actually stood for marriage consistently instead of keeping this our own abomination called out in our scriptures in our back pocket. So, right. So, so as far as, so as far as trying to like see kind of like where sort of nail, nail me down on this, right? Where I'm at. Well, it's, I see a lot of complexity, I guess that's part of what I'm okay. saying. And I, I, so, so on the issues like for LGBTQ members, like definitely, I think the good answers are still forthcoming. Those are still yet to come. Right. I agree. And like, um, I don't, um, I see deep problems in the practice of Mormon polygamy. Um, there is much that disturbs me personally. Um, and so it's not like I think to myself, like the way that I would want to live would be to have like, say two wives who like they each have sort of half of a life with a husband sure. and I have sort of half of an intimacy with a wife. So, so that is not appealing to me. Right. And so, um, I, I see deep problem on, a, on that personal level and then other sort of ethical levels of sort of ethical sure. critique with how Mormon polygamy is practiced, but that, but I don't necessarily completely reject it as um, I don't entirely reject it. And I think that there, I see space for, to, in my view, it, it seems like in every area of life, and this is the case in scripture, this is the case in church history, this is the case in the world at large, like it's a complex place. Things are complicated. And so I, I see like arguments from scripture, like starting, right, you can start right in Genesis, right, and come up with arguments for sort of a default of monogamy, right? And so I, I see that. Um, and then I also see complexity and I don't, maybe I need to formulate my thoughts better, um, maybe for a future episode or something, but a uh, further comment might clarify what I'm getting at. So, so there are different questions at play in this kind of discussion, right? So one question would be sort of the theology of specifically Mormon polygamy, the way, the way that it was practiced and the way that it was taught the specific sorts of scriptures that are, that were used to argue for it or, or, or that it's partly based on. Right. And then there's also the question that where you're getting, you're going in, in your discussion of the scriptures and polygamy, you've gone beyond just critiquing specifically DNC 132 or Mormon polygamy to making a case for like monogamy as sort of like the scriptural standard, like the standard. And so I guess that my bringing up like polyg polygamy in different polygyny and polyandry in different cultures and like modern polyamory and so on isn't to, it's not like to advocate certain things. It's just to say, well, I know that there are people who have tried polygamy or polygamy-like relationship practices on a different basis from like Mormon polygamy, right? Practice in different ways. And I would be interested in seeing what the, the research on human flourishing says about the sort of the different practices and will ultimately say in the future about them. So, so if I'm thinking about like, sort of like absolutes, is this an absolute to me? Well, I mean, one of the kinds of things that I would want to take into, I, I want to take into account all sorts of ethical considerations, moral considerations, you know, how this, how, how different um, things that practices people may do in different cultures and so on affect their lives. And then um, along with that, right, look at what, what does the research say about how such practices affect human flourishing. So, so I'm not bringing all that up to, um, address Mormon polygamy specifically, but rather to address 
the larger subject that you brought up of sort of like is monogamy like the one invariant standard and so to me that gets complex i guess okay okay that's so interesting so i i I think we can circle back to that but i first want to ask you another question that kind of hits the nail a little more on the head for the polygamy question and then we can talk more about just like tradition i mean more generalized questions of marriage sure right is 132 revelation from god so I think that there is revelation in DNC 132. I think that, and, and I do think that it comes from Joseph Smith. And that- oh, Okay, we might agree on that. You might be surprised to know that we agree on both of those points, but continue. Okay. okay. Um, now we might disagree on, on the specifics of sort of like which parts and so on, because I- um, so I think that because I do think Joseph Smith practiced polygamy and, and in our, I believe our next episode, we're going to go into like details of kind of like, well, why, why do I think that? Right. And, and um, discuss our respective reasons for our respective positions in detail. Um, so the, when I look at, when I look at revelation, I see revelation as always being filtered through the mind of a human being, a prophet, right? And so I don't see revelation as just kind of like, it's all completely 100% divine or it's, or it's all false, right? And so I look at, um, I mean, I, I don't know that, I want to sort of religiously weigh in on what I think it specifically is divine or not divine. I mean, maybe some things um, in 132, like I do find the language that's used very problematic, right? So the language you were talking about, about the, the giving and taking, the sort of belonging or property. I, for language. me, that doesn't come down to language. It's much, okay. much deeper but than language. The language and concepts. The perspective. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. the mind that it mm-hmm. came from. It's mm-hmm. how does this consciousness view women mm-hmm. and men and humanity? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Fair enough. Um, so um, there are certainly things in 132 that I personally have problems with, but I don't reject 132 as a whole as revelation. So I do see the divine in it. And I think that it's coming from Joseph Smith. And like I said, I I mean, like an actual sort of like set of sort of like, well, reasons like, why do you think that would be for our anticipated future discussion? Okay. Um, So yeah. So can I ask, so let me ask another question, kind of piggybacking on that last one. So did Joseph Smith dictate section 132 as we currently have it to William Clayton in the presence of Hiram on July 12th, 1843 in the upper room of the red brick store? I think he did. So you, so you accept that. So you think that the whole thing came from Joseph and the problems that you have with it are where Joseph's mind got some things pure, some things not pure. And he said he he dictated that in so so William Clayton's you you accept William Clayton's narrative on that that that's fine I'm just trying to clarify. So uh, I mean yes like I I would make the caveat that like I would accept the outlines of William Clayton's narrative on this I would per our previous discussion about historical sources, sure. I would not treat him as some sort of absolute. I would right. try to but, take his account in the context of other accounts. And so, but the other- general sense, the general sense that Joseph Smith did dictate this on that date, and it was yeah. written as we now have it. So, it. so it's not been tinkered with or adjusted. It's, it's, what like, what, like, so I guess what I'm quest- saying is you are kind of reserving the right to say, yes, that came from Joseph, but I don't have to accept all of it as revelation. He said all of it that day, but I can look at it and go, uh, I'm throwing that part out personally. Am I understanding that correctly? 
Basically. So, okay. yeah, I think that Joseph himself is an imperfect revelatory instrument, so to speak. And I think that the enormous pressure of the situation did not bring out the best in Joseph and that that gets reflected in how this revelation is dictated. Okay. Okay. This is really helpful to help me understand your perspective too. So can I piggyback on that again? Sure. Um, what other revelations of Joseph do you also take issue with or do you reject partial portions of them or all of them, or is it just specifically um, 132? Um, that's a good question. So, I mean, my same general sense that I bring to 132, I bring to Revelation in general, right? So, so through Joseph Smith, but also through other prophets, like in other books of script, in the various books of scripture, right? And so I, it's not, the way that I would frame it is not, oh, like I accept parts of certain revelations and then reject other parts. It's that I see, because I see revelation inherently as a kind of divine human co-creation, then I see in some places more of the divine and in some places more of the human. And so sometimes the human can be very problematic. I, I mean, I think it's that's easiest to see, like let's say in like the Old Testament, right? Where there are a variety of laws that seem horrendous, right? And so on. Um, in Justice Smith's revelations, um, specifically, like what do I see? This is a good question. I mean, I would have to think about it, like places where I think that Joseph was like, um, well, okay, I think um, uh, DNC 10 um, calls Martin Harris a wicked man and um, seems rather harsh toward Martin regarding the loss of the 116 pages. Um, there are things in DNC 10 where I, I suspect that Joseph's own, like the, the, the human part of this human divine collaboration that is revelation. I, I see places where maybe the human is more dominant, let's say. And so maybe sometimes there are certain revelations rebuking certain people, like in this case, Martin, that are overly harsh. And um, I think you actually have the same thing in DNC 19, again, to Martin Harris. Um, and, um, the, there's a narrative, it's controversial, but I, I have evidence, I have papers that I intend to publish that, right, that I've done research for, the papers are not fully written at this point, but about what's known as the Canadian copyright revelation. Um, so for years, this was known only kind of by rumor, so to speak, historical rumor, you might say, like um, David, more than rumor, but like there were historical sources that said that in 18, in like early 1830, Joseph Smith had a revelation saying that they could finance the publication of the Book of Mormon. They could cut Martin Harris out of that process because Martin wasn't sort of cooperating sufficiently by selling a Canadian copyright to the going up, sending people up to Canada, Oliver Cowdery and others up to Canada to secure a Canadian copyright to the revelation. I mean, to the Book of Mormon, which they could then be sold, which would then produce more than enough revenue, it was thought, to pay off the printer for those books in, at the Grandin Press, right? Now, this revelation, um, uh, Hiram Page was one of the people involved in going with Oliver Cowdery up to Canada based on this revelation. He wrote about it in the 1840s. David Whitmer remembered it decades later. Um, some historians disputed, Latter-day Saint historians disputed whether it had ever happened. And then um, a manuscript revelation book, it was disclosed, had actually been in the possession of the first presidency, it was handed over to the Joseph Smith papers like 15, more than 15 years ago, I think. And so it's that revelation is now published, right? 
um, Joseph Smith, because the revelation had um, kind of not worked out for the people who were sent to Canada, they weren't able to find a buyer in the city that they were specifically sent to and so yeah, on. Yeah, okay, um, I remember this. Uh -huh. Joseph um, reportedly said he didn't intend to publish the revelation because there were problems with it. And uh, it, it was not published in the Book of Commandments and the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants. So I, I have, and I have other, other things that I'll lay out in this paper indicating that Joseph himself did in fact think that the revelation was problematic. Now, I don't know that what he thought is, I think it's the way it's usually painted is he thought the whole revelation was a false revelation. I'm not convinced that's what he thought at all. I think actually maybe he thought that there were aspects of the revelation that came from his own mind that sort of bled into what was otherwise a divine communication. And so he chose not to publish it, you know. I get that that concept. He said that there are revelations of God, there are revelations of devil, and there are revelations of man, or whatever right. order he put it right. in. Okay. Right, 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 right. And I think mm -hmm. maybe, maybe what happens is that revelations actually can actually be even there can even be a blend of the human and the divine. I think there's inevitably a kind of blend of the human sure. and the divine. And, and it's stronger in some, some places you're dealing so clearly in scripture, you're so clearly dealing with the divine. You're dealing with something that's so beautiful and transcendent and inspiring. And then in some places in, in the scriptures, there are things that seem more strange or jarring or like so so latter-day saints are not fundamentalists when it comes to this they're not like right. christian fundamentalists we don't believe in the inerrancy of scripture the book of mormon says on its title page right toward the end you know if there be faults that they, they be the mistakes of men therefore condemn not the things of god right and mm -hmm. so there is this um sense in latter-day saint scripture that latter-day saint scripture itself does not have to be perfect, does not have to be free from error, does not have to be 100% divine in order to actually be legitimate. Okay, I really appreciate that answer. Thank you. That was very thoughtful. And actually, I'm super impressed. I didn't mean to put you on the spot quite like that. And and when you pulled out Doctrine and Covenants 10, and I'm like, wow, good, like that. Anyway, I, that was that was really impressive. I want to thank you for that sincere answer. Um, I wasn't I want to clarify, I wasn't asking it in order to try to trap you or trip you up. Oh. I, you know, I, I'm sorry if it came across that way. Oh, I just, for me, there is such a distinct difference between 132 and all of the rest of the scriptures. And I do have my little hangups here and there, things that I'm like, uh, I, I don't love how that sounds, you know, and I'm, 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 I'm very willing to think critically about them. Right. And I don't just accept it all. It's just yeah. 132 yeah. seems to be in its own complete completely different category where so that's why i was asking okay. like okay. like to me it would be like whoa joseph jumped the shark with that one that was completely out of character for him mm -hmm. and i you know and and that seems yes. um that seems kind of like a hard historical case to make because joseph faced a lot of stress yeah. in his life so that's that's why i was kind of asking okay. to okay. just you know does that make sense to you that it totally. does seem quite different yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i can understand that yeah yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So where else did you want to go? Did you have somewhere else you wanted to go? Well, so, I, so I guess a couple, um, well, actually, let me, I guess before I speak too much here, let me actually look at the notes that I wrote. I think I've largely been covering these. Okay. I guess, um, I guess that I would be interested in talking about maybe like Abraham and Jacob. Oh, great. Bible. And then Jacob too in the Book of Mormon. Um, maybe maybe a quick comment on 132 before that. Okay. So I, and, and maybe this is part of, maybe this goes along with how you feel about 132 in terms of like, cause you expressed, you think that part of it um, was it's from true. God and came to Joseph. Um, so I look at something like um, verses, I think it's like 19 and 20. And it actually says, oh, okay, well, maybe preface to this. So if you look back in the 1800s in the church, you have George Q. Cannon giving this idea that like the, the Latter-day Saint doctrine of exaltation or deification somehow didn't apply to women. 
Okay. He said that men become gods, but women don't become goddesses. And he was apparently getting this from how he read like some passage in Jeremiah about how they weren't supposed to worship the queen of heaven, who was like a particular pagan deity. And so he's thinking it means there are no female gods, there are no goddesses, right? Um, you have when Bruce McConkie's first edition of Mormon Doctrine came out in 1958, there was actually a kind of private critique done by Marky e. Peterson. You know, it's strange. Th these are both super doctrinal conservatives, right? Um, but nonetheless, Marky e. Peterson had heavy criticisms of McConkie's manuscript. And one of the issues that he raised is that Bruce McConkie said that when they're exalted, men become gods and women become goddesses. And Marky e. Peterson was questioning whether women actually become goddesses. He's questioning whether there's, the, it's, it seems like the idea that George Cuchanan had and Marky e. Peterson at least might have had or considered was that like men become divine, but women don't. Women are something less. Now you look at DNC 132 and like, it's strange that if these guys believe in DNC 132, it's strange that they would think this because in, I think it's like I said, I think it's like 19 and 20 maybe, but like it, it talks about, you know, if, if a couple, they like enter into like, you know, the new normal. You shall come forth in the first resurrection and it shall be, um, and, and if it should be after the resurrection in the next resurrection and shall inherit thrones, kingdoms, principalities, powers, dominions, all heights and depths, then shall it be, and it goes on from there, that right. they together as a couple receive right. all of the prophecies. They shall be gods. Yeah. All mm -hmm. things are subject to them. Who is it talking about? It's clearly talking about that man and woman. Right. And so 132, like, yes, it has like the, the giving and taking sort of aspect, right? But then it's also saying women along with men become gods, right? And right. so it doesn't, I don't look at 132 and see it as entirely, entirely um, demoting to or disturbing regarding women. I also see things here literally elevating and exalting about well, women. Or the equality. So I've actually talked about this quite a bit because those verses, that whole section right there that does talk about eternal marriage mm -hmm. is, is, um, it, well, I, I can't think of the word I'm looking for, but it is one man and one woman. And there could be no exception to that. It couldn't work in any other way. What all of those verses describe, maybe starting with 14 and going on, I'll have to check. But, um, that's, that's the, I guess, 15. It talks about if a man marry a wife, the entire way through that entire section is mm -hmm. restrictively monogamous because mm -hmm. it makes no allowance. It's a man and a woman, and together they follow this, whatever, whichever of these paths they are following, mm -hmm. right? And I find that to be extremely interesting and quite important because everything that that does resonate as true in 132 or that is... Um, potentially something to investigate as true is 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 um monogamous and there's no exception mm -hmm. to that it can't be different just like the rest of the doctrine and covenants and see that's why i think it's interesting because joseph smith i think we do have the evidence to show that he had a revelation on eternal marriage and mm -hmm. that he taught it publicly I've, I've mentioned it before but he on july 16th 1843 four days after he supposedly dictated this revelation and when his marriage with Emma was in shambles and blah 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 he spoke all day at the temple stand and that afternoon we have I think three three or four different sources of the sermon he gave where he taught eternal marriage and he spoke about um the the Sadducees coming to Jesus and and yeah. asking him posing right. him the question right, right? and mm -hmm. then and then he gave the answer that that they need to be married in view of eternity and said that um, more could be given after the temple was, was established, right? So that could have been a new revelation he received. Then if we go forward, we have um, Hiram Smith teaching the same concepts, at least in the, in the unedited version right. of his April 8th sermon in 1844 Hiram talked mm -hmm. about being troubled that Jerusha had died and um mm -hmm. you know and then it was edited to say that he was sealed to both women but that's not what the original said and there's no way to mm -hmm. Hiram was not ambiguous in that sermon the whole reason for that conference mm -hmm. as I understand it was to put down polygamy and to oppose polygamy right so he 
he gave a scathing speech and he spoke on eternal marriage. And then if we go forward even further, when the Nauvoo Expositor, when William Law was claiming that Hiram had showed him this revelation, right? When Joseph and Hiram were denying that in the June 4th, I mean, the June 8th and 10th, 1844 um, city council meetings, they say again, what exactly what the revelation was, that it was based on the question mm-hmm. of the Sadducees. I think mm-hmm. it's in Luke 20 or Luke 22. Yeah. Anyway, saying that this, that they, that the, the whole amount of the revelation was that a man needed to be married in view of eternity. Hiram said that anything, that anything else had to do with former times, not now, which is that question of the Sadducees about leveret marriage, which mm-hmm. they knew was a stupid law. So they were using it to try to trip Jesus up. You, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, they knew it was problematic. And then we go forward beyond that. I just, I know this is for our next discussion. I just, part of what you were asking is how I came to this. Yeah. And, and it seems to fit in here because I think this applies. So yeah. I think Joseph, I think there is strong evidence that Joseph absolutely did have a revelation on eternal marriage yeah. that he taught. Hiram said, because some people have asked, well, why wouldn't they have published it in the 1844 Doctrine and Covenants? But Hiram said in that April 8th sermon that this was not to go abroad to the world, but to be, was to be taught only to the people in Nauvoo who were contributing to the temple. So this was like a temple worthy doctrine, which I think is interesting is how I read that. But then if we go forward, um, William Law claimed that Hiram brought him the revelation, right? But William Law in his, oh, what is it, 1884? I'll have to look up the date, interview with Dr. Weil, his letters back and forth, and then his interview that he did. And he says explicitly that the revelation he was shown, I be, I, I think there could very well have been a false revelation going around. What I don't believe is that Hiram brought it to him. I think that's the part they were lying about. But he explicitly says that it was three pages long and that the rest of it was gotten up in Utah is what both he and Dr. Weil say. So he is on testimony, like William Law, one of the main um, contemporaneous sources we have of anything to do with Joseph's polygamy himself says it was only three pages. And then we have um, James Whitehead, who was one of Joseph's scribes, who in the Mm -hmm. Temple Lot case also says that he saw a revelation, I believe, in winter quarters and that it only taught eternal marriage. It was shown to Mm -hmm. him by Bishop Whitney. Mm -hmm. It only taught eternal marriage, didn't have anything about polygamy at all and that it was three pages long right. and so if we put all of those and and that generally is completely ignored the, right. so to me when i look at those pieces of evidence and i look at this portion of doctrine and covenants 132 that is about eternal marriage and is strictly monogamous mm-hmm. i can see that and then i can look at all of this other sure. garbage that doesn't that doesn't go along with it at all. And the the mistakes are in all of these other parts, like verse one, saying that Joseph asked God how he justified Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and and David, and Solomon, when, and then we say he asked that question because he was working on his translation of the Bible. But if we go look at Joseph's translation of the Bible, every single time it talked about David, Joseph made it more harsh. He made David more condemned for his for his polyg- you know, like that is that is not, it's impossible to say that Joseph would have asked that question. And then that's on top of the doc of the Book of Mormon that he either translated or came up with whatever people, however people want to interpret it. Cause I'm, I'm, we're fighting on two fronts, both the Mormon, the traditional Mormon narrative and the anti-Mormon narrative, right? But, but everything that Joseph ever said, did, wrote, everything, points to his dedication to monogamy. And so even in the JST, he was changing it to shore it up to make sure that David could never be used as an excuse for polygamy. So that's why 132 is so bizarre. So sorry, I just, there's a bunch of, um, there's a bunch of like, notes for next time there's there's a bunch of cheat sheet for yeah, next conversation sure, so i know sure. we're not getting into that but sure. i want to spell it out because we were talking about this i'm not asking you to respond to it sure. necessarily so the, right so there's a lot we'll talk about about um like why would one believe that 132 like as a whole uh comes from joseph and then I do think. Well, I'm just trying to make the case. I'm trying to explain to you why I see it differently. I'm not trying to necessarily ch- say prove. You know, I'm just saying what you brought up about these beautiful parts of what, or these potentially true parts of 132, make perfect sense in the model that I see. Right? I think they est- they support that model. So anyway, we can move on. I just wanted to explain why I was going into that, so you could kind of have a better understanding of where I'm coming from. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And so, um, 
like I think for sure there's there's definitely contemporaneous evidence that there was a revelation, right? As you're pointing out, and so then um, then the question becomes what did and did not the revelation contain, and so um, you know that uh, we can talk more about that next time. Um, I, as, as an aside, I guess I would say verses 14 through, I think it's 20, I would see them as, it's interesting that like it talks about a man and a woman, right? I would see that as descriptively monogamous. Um, I don't see it actually saying the only way that people can be exalted is if they, like this can only apply to like a man and a woman. Can I explain how I get there? But I definitely do see that it is talking about a man and a woman. I think that's absolutely important in interpreting it because it's not making polygamy some kind of requirement to reach, you know, 19 verses 18 through 20 or whatever. It's not making it some sort of requirement to achieve exaltation. Right. The the reason some of the reasons, and I I I did I've talked about this in previous episodes, so I won't go into it fully, but one thing I find interesting is it says that if they are, if, if they are um, not together, right, then they are separate mm -hmm. and single and alone and as right. the angels mm -hmm. in heaven, right? Sure. And so I guess the, and it also describes the process of how they ascend together, one and one, you know, right. like together as a unit. So that's the question. They ascend through this process as a unit. So does the man then leave and leave the wife separate and single while he goes and ascends again with another woman? And it makes no allowance for there being more than one woman in that ascendant process. And so I do think that even if, if you try to look at it really logically and, and consider what it's saying, how could it possibly work in any other way than what it's than what it's laying out for us? Because if he if he leaves his one wife to go ascend through this process with another wife, she's separate and single as the angels. They're not united as one. Yeah. Um yeah. Okay. So there's like, I mean, I just say that there's like some theological interpretation of it there, like about them being like one versus separate and single. And it's actually something to which I would be somewhat sympathetic because I do see, like, I look at like Mormon polygamy, right? And like I said earlier, I see it like, I mean, I wouldn't, this isn't what I would I wouldn't want to feel divided, right, in my... Right, right. But that's not the question. The question is, is this of God or what portions of it are of God? And how can we, how can we um, decipher, how, you know, how can we separate right. it out? Right. So, but I was just getting to the issue of, and, and we, it's something that we see differently, right? But whether, whether those verses, we agree that they're talking about a man and a woman. And so it certainly makes it sound like, a man and a woman can be exalted, right? It seems like it would be difficult to read it some other way in those verses. Um, I don't see Which it as ex specifically excluding the po possibility of some kind of, of, of polygamy, but that's, um, but, but like, but we absolutely agree. There is a contemporaneous revelation. There's contemporaneous evidence for a revelation. And I so would say a what, real revelation and at least one false revelation, one fraudulent revelation that many of the apostles were talking, many of the polygamists were talking about. But go ahead. I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. I don't think there was just uh, one document. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't see contemporaneous evidence for multiple revelations circulating at that time. Um, but like, so so the, the question of like the origins of 132, yeah, we'll we'll get into like next more time. of the historical evidence on that in our next discussion. That's okay. It. Yeah. So, and, and I was bringing this up more, just trying to show the theological problems as I see them, because yeah. it's interesting that you say 132 itself makes it clear that, ex that uh, monogamy is at least perfectly sufficient for exaltation. Right. And yet all of the polygamists taught very different than that. Right. We have Brigham Young on record and and the only men who will be the gods or even the sons of God are those who are polygamous, right. at least in their heart. And that's just one of many, it's many quotes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, and so I think that, um, you know, it's 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 interesting how. To make the polygamous theological claim, we have to 
separate all the pieces apart and not really think of it you know it doesn't it doesn't work the theological claim for polygamy doesn't work and so that's why i'm so so it sounds like to me you're saying from your perspective at this time which i just want to make sure i'm clear okay. this did come from joseph smith yeah part of it from god and part of it was not valid revelation and 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 the, the what the polygamist taught about polygamy was incorrect because it's oh, not right so i would say it, it came um I would say my perspective is that 132 was dictated by Joseph Smith, that it is by, by the nature of how I view revelation and the revelatory process, it is a sort of human divine collaboration where in parts of it, we see more of the divine and in parts of it, we see more of the human. And um, that, uh, yes, I don't, there are, there are complexities in exegesis, and I've done a lot in the past a lot of exegesis with the NC 132. I do want to try to understand it like on its own terms, what it's saying. I've had different views at different times about what is it saying in this part or that part about whether polygamy is essential to exaltation. It definitely does not look like, and I'll, I'll say in the verses that we were looking, that we're talking about, like 14 to like 19 or 20, I think it, it I see those verses don't mention polygamy at all. And yet they talk about couples being exalted. And so it certainly does not look there like polygamy is essential to exaltation. It does look like maybe in other parts of 132, like it might be might be saying that. And so that's and so then we get into questions of how do you correctly interpret those passages? And then we get into questions that you know you and I are going to discuss further about, well, how much of this was this all from Joseph Smith, or or was some of it added, or or some by others, or something right. like that? But yeah, that's to me, yeah, that's a good point. That to me, that's more of the internal contradiction that shows that it's very problematic. Yeah. But, so yeah. so in any case, we can at least agree that at least many of the polygamous portions of one thirty two are not from God. You would agree to that. So like verse sixty three. Okay. So, so again, I, I mean, the way that I'm, the way that I'm framing this, and how I think about it, and in how I, and therefore how I describe it, is different from the form that the, your questions are taking. Oh, okay. so, so, the way that I frame it is, revelation inherently is a human divine collaboration or co-creation. Different aspects of revelation reflect. Some of them reflect more of the divine. Some reflect more of the human. So, so my point isn't to say, why well, reject this as divine? I mean, there are there are things that are very problematic in 132 that I think reflect Joseph Smith's level of frustration and so on in the situation. And so you could say, yeah, I, I guess that's how I would phrase it. Um, so if I were to say like verse 63, I can read it if you want. It's just my particular favorite verse of the whole thing, you know. But um, if I were to read that verse, would you say it's like 90-10, Joseph God, 50-50? Where, where do you put that? Given to him to bear the souls of men in the eternal world. It's, but if either of the 10 virgins after she has espoused shall be with another man, she has committed adultery and shall be destroyed. For they are given unto him to multiply and replenish the earth according to my commandment and to fill, fulfill the promise which was given by God before the foundation of the world and for their exaltation in the eternal worlds for they, um, that they bear the souls of men. For herein is the work of my father continued that he may be glorified. So I, I like that verse. We could just go with the first half of it. Right. But if 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 one of either of the 10 virgins that have been given to him in the previous verse, after she is espoused, shall be with another man, she has committed adultery and shall be destroyed for they are given unto him to multiply and replenish the earth according to my commandment. So God, I, Joseph, I, I would have. So I would have points of disturbance and points of critique in this verse as with others uh, in 132 I the way that I view it I guess isn't just that like 
a certain part is sort of like all Joseph or all God. Um, this is why I'm asking. Let me clarify. Okay. This matters. Okay. And this is where I get intense. Okay. Okay. Is this how God views women? That's the question. Is okay. this how God views women? And we we keep okay. soft right. like like pandering okay. around it. And you know, okay. this is the verse that President Nelson referenced in his very first um um what do you call it press conference as the new president of the church, right? It's like mm -hmm what's going on because we've really ignored it before that so that brought it back into the forefront like like i i just want to know we as a people is this who we say god is that matters so, okay. so you're saying to help me understand so you're saying like specifically in this verse that the idea that they're given to a man so so, so we can have a whole group of women a, a, a so, number of women and then ten virgins given unto him by this law, yeah. he cannot commit adultery, for they belong to him, and they are given unto him. Right. Therefore, is he justified? Yeah. But if one of the ten virgins commit right. adultery, she's committed, then she shall be destroyed. Right. That 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 entire that's just one one little encapsulation of this concept of this mm -hmm. perspective. It's not wording. It's not language. It is what are women, what are men, and what are women, and how mm -hmm. do they? interact with one another yeah. correctly according to God. Yeah. So are, are men and women equals who come together on a kind of equal footing and there is a fit between them, there's a synergy between them and this is how it is between like our heavenly parents and this is what they want for us or is it like will you have a whole group of women who belong to a particular man and they're given to him to like create a bunch of children and sort of that's his glory or their well, glory and, or or yeah and, and I'm, more I'm than sort of framing two alternative yeah. viewpoints so my right. viewpoint would be the first right so this so, is not from god so you would reject <laughs> at least these verses and say these are not of this does not represent the mind of god can we at least agree on that portion so i would say that to the extent that what I just characterized in the second statement, second alternative, is what this is saying, then I would see that as more coming from the human aspect here than the divine aspect. Yes, okay. I don't see that. I don't see that as a good description of how God views women. Okay. I, I think it matters because this is currently in our canonized scriptures, right? As I talked about in that episode, um, we haven't lived, I think 101 was canonized according to um, common consent and was in the Doctrine and Covenants until 1980. And so only for 10 years, 1880, thank you. Anyway, so this is this wasn't put in by common consent. It wasn't, it didn't follow the same prop mm -hmm. procedure. It wasn't, you know, wasn't that, that wasn't removed by common. So we haven't been following the procedures of the church. And I think the reason this matters is because so many people, both men and women, read this and think this is how God views men and women. So this is how I should view men and women. Right. Like men read that and adopt it. Right. Women read that. Right and are devastated. Yes. And that's why it matters. Yes. Right. I mean, so when we when we kind of soft pedal around it, we don't we don't do what we need to do. This, I mean, this is this when I say I'm I'm offended by this perspective of God. This is part of what I'm talking about. Yes. Because because this is in this is now canonized, not by common consent, not according to the law of the church, not done correctly. But since it's canonized, right, the fruits of it follow. And that's what we see in early Mormon polygamy. And that's what we see ongoing in fundamentalist communities. And yeah. and and even just in attitudes, because people who even aren't living polygamy but are expecting to someday, yeah. both men and women, it does really bad things. It yeah. twists people's souls in, in yeah. negative ways. Yes, yes, yes. So, so an analogy. So um, it has been pointed out that the canon of scripture, and this is mostly pointed out by people just whose canon is the Bible, right? But it applies for the whole Latter-day Saint canon as well. It's been pointed out that the canon of scripture contains a number of terrible acts of violence 
and that to the extent that that is canonical and therefore seen as divine, that that's problematic because it can encourage people to think that such violence is okay. We have slavery in the Old Testament. Can I speak to that last point? Sure. I don't want to interrupt you. I just wanted to bring that into the into this discussion. Exactly what you said. Those acts of violence being in our scriptures is is troubling, right? right. Like like the concubine and the city of Gabea is a right. really troubling story right. that I don't like. Mm-hmm. And when people use yes. that to in any positive way, I want right. to know what they're talking about, right? Yes. But um, but for example, Ogden Kraut, ha- yeah. he's one of the main yeah. um polygamy scholars, but as I looked in and studied more, I realized all he's doing is echoing Orson Pratt. He's just regurgitating Orson Pratt's arguments. One of the main Mormon fundamentalist authors advocating. Yes, I'm sorry. He's, he's, I, 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 I'm thinking of what I'm going to say, so I don't know if my words are coming out right. Yes, he's, he's the scriptorian and the, he's written many, many books defending polygamy scripturally relying primarily on Orson Pratt's mm-hmm. arguments. Yeah. He goes in depth in at least one of his books, it might be Polygamy in the Bible or something else, talking yeah. about how, like as evidence of how much God loves polygamy is that when they were, when the, he doesn't use the word genocide, I will use that. When they were commanded mm-hmm. to go do these genocides, right. they weren't supposed to kill the little girls. Right. And that's so all of these valiant soldiers right. could have additional wives because right. God wanted to honor them and God right. polygamy so much. That's, right horrific right. horrific we are talking about little traumatized right. girls whose entire family right. murdered and then they were raped right that's what we're defending and they have to spend their whole lives that way yeah yeah right. well unless they're rejected there are rules about how the guy gets to decide right. if he wants to keep her or not right. after he's raped her right? right there are rules about like like all of that is unacceptable and we have embraced it yes. more than any other religion, right? And and are still defending it in this polygamous mindset. So that's... Yeah. Right. So Anyway, so, so, there, so I, I agree with you completely. Right. right. So there are things like that that are in the canon of scripture that are stomach turning, right? Mm-hmm. Like they make you want to vomit. Right. right? Except that we as polygamists, yeah. the polygamists embrace them. And he, he has like three exclamation points after each sentence, how excited yeah. he is about this. Right. So, sorry, I, it is stomach turning. It's, no, it's it's, it, it's horrible. It's yeah. horrible. So then, this raises larger questions for people who have a canon of scripture that has things in it that are morally problematic, and in some cases, far more than just morally problematic. That's a deep understatement. Like here, right? So, um, I, yeah. I don't see this is another part of that. Like, I understand this argument, but I don't see an equivalency because the Old Testament is how many thousands of years old, came from what sources, has been reworked in what ways, defending what cultural practices and what kingdom and right. So it's we can expect it to be problematic and we can each decide how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. 132 came in 1852. It was abhorrent at the time to the entire society. It cannot be defended as some ancient thing that is problematic. We just have to figure out how to interpret it. It is said to be current modern revelation directly from God. And I would say that most, I appreciate that you're willing to view it. And I would, even if you don't say it directly, I would say that it sounds to me like you're condemning parts of it at least, right? And um, like the verses we just read, and it's it's coming. I would say that most Mormons won't. Many many members of the church have a problem doing that because it's canonized. So we think we have to accept mm. it and grapple with it. But it doesn't. It's not the same as the Old Testament because it's new and it was in opposition to the society. The entire society was horrified at what Brigham Young was doing, mm. right? And so so it can't be justified. We can't equate it to the Old Testament and say, oh, they're kind of the same. It's a problem in both so, instances. So, this right. is far worse. So we, can, so we can point out how these instances are different, right? So we can point out that, like, in the case of some of these laws that are given in the Old Testament and narratives that are given in the Old Testament, there are absolutely horrendous things that occur and that are described and that are prescribed, right? And so um, then because there's such a time distance between us and the reported events, 
because there's such a time distance between us and the text. And so we don't know who wrote the text necessarily, how it was changed over time. It might be easier to grapple with those things and say, well, that reflected the culture at the time, or that was some sort of interpolation into the text. So I, I not, we, we don't view it as inerrant, right? right. Right. So, so I see the so I do see the differences that you're pointing out, right? I also I also think that where there is a commonality is that these are these things are all in our canon of scripture. And so that is the same, whether other things are the same or not. So to me, there are larger questions about. So, so there, the Book of Mormon is also, right, like it's talking about events in an ancient context. It is modern Latter-day Saint scripture, but when it talks about like the Lamanites being cursed with the skin of blackness, and this was to make them abhorrent or whatever, this is uh, deeply problematic stuff that's in restoration scripture. So I don't think restoration scripture is free of like difficult things. We have things in the canon that are, are distasteful and morally repugnant and should be morally repugnant to us. And so then what do we do with the fact that they're in the canon? So I'm just saying for me personally, when I look at things that I have a problem with in DNC 132, I see it as part of a larger problem of problematic and morally repugnant things in scripture rather than just like sort of a one-off event where this occurs in 132 but nowhere else. That's 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 all I'm saying. Okay, I can appreciate that. I And I would push back on um, a couple of things because I do think that the point that this is a morally repre reprehensible scripture brought forward in 1852, it, you know, is it makes it very different than the Bible that we inherited, right? And then also, I would push back on your um, interpret and your um, way of viewing the racism in the Book of Mormon. I mm -hmm. think that I highly, highly recommend the work of Marvin Perkins. I think he's done beautiful work on this, and um, he's been on this channel. I think he's great, mm -hmm. and also. I, I think you'd I think you would find it interesting how he points to it actually is consistent with Old Testament idioms that would have been about the same time. Job is described as having a skin of blackness. There are other times that that in Jeremiah as well, and it's talking about a dejected or a darkened or a depressed or a suffering state, where where a light countenance is is used in that way, not to talk about race, but to talk about other other aspects of humans. And I think that's useful. And also I think it's useful to recognize, like, for example, in Jacob 2 and 3, the Book of Mormon in so many ways is an anti-racist book. It mm -hmm. condemns mm -hmm. the Nephites for being racist. So yeah. I, again, like I hear what you're saying. I just don't think that there's equivalency between these things. I think 132 is, is quite unique in its badness. <laughs> And well, so, I, I don't think it's unique in its badness. And so we we would, okay, we we would differ on that. Yeah. I guess I'm saying the Old Testament has plenty of awful stuff in it. The New Testament has some, in my opinion, stuff that I don't resonate with at all that I do not think came from God. Right. But but we didn't we didn't add those things to our scriptures in 1880. Sure. That's that's I guess what I'm, you know. That's something we can at least, we didn't claim that God spoke that in the modern world and here it is for us. So, okay. So should we, now that we've talked all this time, should we go to Abraham and Jacob? Are you still up to sure, continue? Sure, okay. sure. I mean, maybe, I don't know if this, I'm trying to think if this analogy would help. Um, yeah, go for it. I mean, I think in, I think it's, is it Moroni chapter nine? Uh, there's like a letter that, I Mormon. might be getting it wrong, um, where like Mormon is writing to Moroni and he talks about, he's actually, he's talking about the depredations that the Nephites committed against the Lamanites, particularly the Lamanite women. You're good. And, you know your scriptures well. Yeah. It looks like it is Moroni night. Mm -hmm. and, and it says like that they deprive them of 
that which that was the most sacred. precious above all other things, which is chastity or virtue. Now, like the clear intent here in the passage is to like defend women, right? That the clear intent is to say how terrible it is that they would do something so horrendous to these women, right? It's to show what a low level they had sunk to that's preceding their destruction, right? But the, the language that it's clothed in in order to make that very positive point is such that it actually suggests that women can be forcibly deprived of what is most valuable wow. about them. So for survivors of sexual abuse, this, I, I know from talking to some, sorry. No, this would be- but This is a really painful thing, right? And so I do look at scripture, even where there are things in scripture that are very, they have maybe a positive basis to them or intention. There can be things in scripture that cause a great deal of pain. There can be things in scripture that are off in various ways. And I'm not saying that's equivalent to, I'm not trying to say that's equivalent to certain things in 132. I'm just trying to say, I'm just trying to give my larger perspective that like scripture has things in it that are problematic scripture as a whole. And so for me, there's just an issue of what do we do with the fact that we have things in our canon of scripture that cause pain or that sometimes are distasteful or morally repugnant? You know, what, what do we do with that? And so then that's where, that's the kind of place that my mind goes when I look at something like 132, and so we can we can talk we can argue about you know is there really an equivalence a full equivalence and and that's not I mean that's that's not I guess something that I would try to demonstrate that somehow there is a full equivalence here, um, but I but I do think when when I just to answer for myself personally when I look at difficult things in 132. That's the kind of frame that I'm bringing is, hey, I see this kind of, I, I see different problematic things in scripture more generally. How do I deal with that, right? Now, now the, our, our restoration cousins, the community of Christ, actually, um, they have come up with their own way of dealing with it. You know, they've kept adding to their Doctrine and Covenants in their section, I think it was 163 several years ago from their president, Stephen Vesey. Who's now being replaced by actually a um, oh, Stacy a Cram, a woman, a prophetess, um, female prophet. Um, uh, the Revelation actually talks about scripture and it says things in scripture cannot be used to justify discrimination or inequality. And so you kind of have four members of the community of Christ. This is part of their way. How do they deal? with difficult things within their canon of scripture, well, they have more scripture that says to them, sort of like meta scripture, it's scripture about scripture that's saying, well, the way that we deal with difficult things in scripture is if it's oppressive to people, we don't use it as some sort of precedent or basis. We reject that in light of higher principles in scripture. And scripture definitely, there's an idea, it's a very old idea um, in at least Protestantism, and it may go back further but like there's an idea of what they call like a canon within the canon. So not everything within the canon is equally canonical. It's all sure. in the canon. But sure. like words of Jesus are gonna hold more weight than the words of Leviticus or 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 the words of well, anybody, probably, mm -hmm. right? But like the words of Jesus are gonna hold more weight than the words of Alma or you know Song of Solomon, yeah. say. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so and so there are sort of higher principles within the canon that can be used maybe to judge lesser, lower things within the canon, right? And say, no, that's not, that's not right because we have this higher principle to judge by. Um, yeah. So I see, I see like a lot of complexity in our canon of scripture. I don't think that, I actually don't think that everything in the canon, like I, I do think like the Book of Mormon says there are mistakes of men I do think that there are things in scripture that don't fit with each other, that sometimes they jar. Um, and sort of what, what do we do with that as believers, right? What do we do with right. that as saints? Well, for me, it, it's part of a reflection of the larger complexity of the world. God, 
God has made an extraordinarily complex world. And when we want to understand it, um, like a lot of people leave, a lot of people that I've observed lose their faith because of the idea that everything is simple. Like, yeah. like I grew up hearing and I hear still over the pulpit, well, the gospel is just so perfectly simple and that's how we know that it's true. And then people study into church history or they find complexities in doctrine or scripture or things about, uh, they look at like LGBTQ issues and they find complexities and, and whatnot. And they're like, it's not simple, therefore it's not true, right? And, and, and I think about that and I think, well, when we study astronomy, when we study the worlds, we expect complexity. When we study organic chemistry, we expect complexity. When we study sociology or economics, we expect complexity. But then we think that when we're talking about the God that created all of that, we expect total simplicity. No, that's not how it works. The, the complexity of the world should be an indicator to us that there's going to be complexity all over. God has made a complex world. I find complexity in the world. I find complexity in the human world. I find complexity in scripture and religion. I And so, and so I, um, that's just kind of part of my approach. Yeah, I actually love that. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. I think that that is really beautiful and profound. And I'm really glad you shared Moroni 9.9 because I think it's good for us to be more aware of pain points that can be triggered by, yeah. you know, from people's individual experience. I think that's really useful. I have, I have in the past read this as someone trying to have compassion yeah. for the victims. Cool. I think and, it is. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah but it. but yeah. but I think that is one of those. Ooh, different words would have been helpful there. Yeah, absolutely, if, absolutely. That, yeah. So so okay. Thank you for thank you for explaining all of that. I really do appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, Abraham and Jacob. Yes. Yeah. Abraham and Jacob and Jacob. How's that? We okay, get, that's great. Two Jacobs for the price of one here. So um, forget Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We'll do Abraham, Jacob, and Jacob. So uh, you will you will agree that that's a mistake. That like so so I will agree that the Bible doesn't say anything at all about Isaac practicing polygamy. It does not make it look at all as though he practiced polygamy. It just mentions one wife. Okay, all right. So, yeah. So um, so I, my yeah. My guess in 132 would be that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is such a common yes, that's what I think. formula that that's why it gets employed there rather than specifically because right. Isaac is supposed to be a polygamist. And so, I don't think that Brigham Young knew his scriptures that well, but I, that was a joke. Okay, continue on. <laughs> <laughs> he said he didn't take time to read the Bible, and I think he had help doing it, but I think he was involved. Okay, but I think you're right. exactly right. It's just Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs, they were polygamists, therefore polygamy. Yeah. Right, right, right. Okay. So, Abraham and Jacob. So you talked in your, um, so, so with Jacob, if I understand you correctly, and I'll go back to Abraham, with Jacob, you see polygamy in the form of like concubinage, right? These, these women are like these handmaids. Well, not with Leah and Rachel, but with Zilpah and Bilhah. Right. I think that's pretty clear. Yes. Okay. So they are, the, the situation with each of them is that they're the women who are their sort of masters, um, uh, Rachel and Leah, um, are they, well, Rachel can't bear a child uh, initially. And so she gives her husband, her handmaid, to bear children for her by proxy. So this is kind of a female parallel to like the Leveret law for males in a way where one woman is supposed to, without the whole death thing, right? But like one woman is supposed to be able to act as a sort of proxy for another woman. This was a cultural practice where-, where Yeah, I don't think it's related to leveret marriage. I don't see it that well, way. I think it's just the surrogacy. I think that when you had a slave- that, That's what I'm saying is that the surrogacy is what they have in common. I'm not surrogacy. saying otherwise related. Right. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, it's the same as Abraham and, um, what were they, yeah. Sarai, Abram and Sarai at yeah. the time yeah. that this happened, that- um, that since Hagar was a slave that was given to her in Egypt, she possessed mm -hmm. her. They owned her body, mm -hmm. right? right? And so they could use her as a surrogate to right. create a child for them. And Rachel and Leah 
Rachel was loved, but Leah was able to have children. Both of them, like that's where we get the word Sarah. That's where we get these horrible, knowing how mm -hmm. awful these things mm -hmm. are, right? And so Rachel wanted to have children. So she employed her slave the same way Leah wanted to be loved. So it became, I call them, I call the, the concubines weapons of mass reproduction in this mm -hmm. arms race between these two mm -hmm. women vying for the love of their husband. They were, and they were vying for the love of their husband. And it's an extraordinarily, I mean, anyone who thinks that this story is a kind of role model story needs to read the story. Right? Both of them. It's, mm -hmm. it's a story of immense emotional pain. You mm -hmm. have, you know, a, a woman who is infertile, who because of that, she feels like she needs to purchase the love of her husband by giving him uh, a, a, her her slave, her handmaid, as a, a polygamous wife, so that he she can have children for him, so that then he will love her because she has children for him while she's competing with yes. her sister for who can I give him the most children, and and the, then the the sister Leah is unloved. She's she's the unfavored wife, and so she's desperate to produce as many children as she can personally, and then by giving him her handmaid. Like so, it, so it's a it's a story of sort of like perpetual heartbreak, and so it's it's uh, and these the the women are of different statuses, right? They the some women are above other women in this order of things, oh, yeah, hierarchy, and so there's just sort of like pain all the way around yeah. here. It's it's not a happy story at all, right? And just like Lamech was the it, polygamy was introduced originally by Lamech, right? This was introduced by the extremely corrupt, horrible father. Is it Layman, right? That Laban. I think he was actually Laban. their brother, wasn't he? Oh, I, thought, La I thought Laman, it was their father, but Laman. but he um I, I mean I, I could look it up, but yeah. but I'm just saying it was not like Doctrine and Covenants multiple times says that both Abraham and Isaac and Jacob says that they were commanded by God. Right. That's right. ridiculous. That's utterly ridiculous. And to imply that God would want this is mm -hmm. ridiculous, right? So, so um, the grandparents, Abraham and, and um, Sarah, had the same problem that Rachel mm -hmm. and um, I am losing my names that Jacob and is it Rachel would have had, with right? Rachel, yeah. mm -hmm. But with yeah. Rachel, it was compounded because at least Sarah didn't have to see her husband having children with her sister that neither yeah. of them liked, mm -hmm. right? That it yeah. was compounded. It was work yeah. because sure. of what Laban did. Sure. Or, and so, so I, and anyway, so yeah, it makes everything worse. And even Sarai, um, Sarah, after proposing the, her slave as a surrogate, it was too horrible, right? And they, yeah. it ended up in child abandonment. There was no yeah. covenant. There was no commandment. So I guess that's part of it is like, these are, terribly tragic stories that make our hearts story. break. And yet again, just like just like with the genocides in the Old Testament, 132 elevates them and glorifies them and prescribes them as mm -hmm. how God wants it to be and how it should be for all of us. So um yeah, very tragic stories, stories of deep human pain. Um, and then you look at um I mean the story of Sarah and Hagar right a similarly distressing set of events i know that in your so so you said that um like bilha and zilpa are definitely like well and i mean Ra rachel leah bilha and zilpa are all clearly in the story they're all married to jacob so this is polygamy these are plural wives bilha and zilpa are given given to you know Abraham by their respective mistresses, masters, uh, uh, Rachel and Leah. And um, so in the case of Abraham and Hagar, I know in the uh, anniversary episode, you said that this wasn't even polygamy, that Hagar is not actually like a wife, if I understood you correctly. I don't. I think it's incorrect to refer to Abraham as a polygamist in any way that we would recognize because, well, uh, well one thing I just want to add in, I think is interesting is you said accurately that Leah and Rachel and Sarah gave their handmaids to their husband. That's because they were theirs to give because they owned them. 
right. they were their possession, right? right? right. And so right. again, it's interesting that 132 incorporates mm -hmm. that in verse 40, 34, where it says, God commanded Abram and Sarah gave Hagar to Abram to wife. And then it goes on to have the law of Sarah, which is that a woman has to give another wife to her husband. And it misses the point that those women Th those slave girls were theirs to give because they owned right. them, right? right? So I just I just wanted to point out another problem in 132. But yes, go ahead. Sure. So, I, I guess so the reason I would say that Abraham wasn't a, a polygamist, he mm -hmm. was obeying, deferring to the wishes of his wife according mm -hmm. to the culture and the law at that time that you could use a slave as a surrogate to have mm -hmm. a baby for them. The baby was never meant to be Hagar's baby. Sarah says maybe... Right. She right. will have a baby for us. For, you know, right. they were going yeah. to take the baby right. and have right. it be theirs. Right. And so, and then once she conceived, she was Abram never Abraham never treated her as a wife. He intentionally said to Sarah, "No, you're in charge. She's your slave. Her status remains Sarah's slave." Mm -hmm. And then um, she never conceived again. It was not ongoing, right? It was mm -hmm. just um, if they had had a better technology, they would you'd have used a better technology. The goal was a child. That was mm -hmm. it. So it was surrogacy. And, you know, so, I've referred to it before as sex slavery. She, she was a slave who mm -hmm. they had sexual access to and could mm -hmm. claim the fruit of her, her womb. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's my perspective on it. Right. Uh, 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 right. Again. Uh, so, again, a horrible story. Right. There's there's a clear hierarchy of human beings here where Hagar is definitely under and owned by Sarai. Um, and so, um, yeah, I disturbing narrative right now i i would see um so, so if what jacob is doing in um being given bill han zilpa uh to bear sort of proxy children by for rachel and leah then i would see abraham practicing polygamy by parallel if the one's polygamy i would see the other as polygamy but it's definitely not in either case. The case of Hagar, hold on, it is, it's not monogamy. Okay. Right? I, I think the clarification... So if we're trying to establish the idea that like there's a sort of consistency of monogamy, right, in scripture. Okay. Well, there, there's not, and there, there's not in the case of Abraham. Now, I will acknowledge that in the biblical stories, it's not saying God told these men to marry these wives. And so... 132 would seem to posit sort of an alternate version of these narratives, right? Where there was like actually divine command along with whatever else is happening. But that's definitely not something that these stories are saying. And the stories themselves are tragic human stories. They're not, when I look at these stories, they do nothing to make me want to imitate them. <laughs> right. That that portion. I think I think the thing I was trying to say with Abraham, like, and maybe it's not an important point because Jacob absolutely was a polygamist. But Abraham didn't continue. It wasn't like even with Jacob, he bore multiple children with yeah. each of those concubines. It wasn't ongoing. Abraham just wanted a sur like, like Sarah, so Sarah, the Sarai just yeah. wanted a surrogate. It wasn't sure. even Abraham that wanted it. So that's why I say sure. like, like that's a, that's a difficult case. Cause it wasn't like he had multiple wives, you know, he was using a surrogate and then that was the only purpose. And then didn't bear another child with her and then even abandoned her at, yes. he, he, he consistently um, consented to do what his wife asked him to do. Right. right. But he did not in any way see himself. And, and in addition, it didn't add to their glory. I, I think this is part of why Abraham and Jacob were not condemned in Jacob, too, is because neither of them wanted it. Neither of them sought it. Both of them were, I would say, victims of polygamy more than anything else. These two men, neither of them saw it in any way as a way to glorify themselves. And neither of them ever engaged in unrighteous dominion. Both of them mm -hmm. were completely um, I, I, they hearkened to the wishes of their wives, right? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. like the wives of Jacob would even tell him who, like, who he was sleeping with that night, based on right. their own, their own mm -hmm. plans. And so, right. I think that that is very, very different than David and Solomon, who are condemned, mm -hmm. and very, mm -hmm. very different than the Mormon polygamists. Yeah. Yes, I, I think there are a host of differences. I think that you're right about that, and I. So as I look at these stories with the caveat that these are tragic stories, 
right? These are not, these don't look like great role model stories. These are tragic stories. Um, I, nonetheless, I don't see that, well, let me take a step back maybe. So um, when Orson Pratt laid out his defense of polygamy starting in 1852, like at length in 1852, it was like scriptural defense of polygamy and then later sermons in the Journal of Discourses defending polygamy, he makes it sound like the, the scriptures are just consistent on teaching polygamy. And he says, you can't show me one passage in the scriptures that in the Bible that opposes polygamy and he says that, you know, if any book of scripture could be said to condemn polygamy, it would be the Book of Mormon. But then he says, but there's a proviso, right, with, with the, you know, which we'll talk about. But like, um, there's this loophole. So um, he wants to have this view of the scriptures where the scriptures are absolutely uniform in what they say about marriage. And it's all polygamy all the time, right? And that, as, 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 we've discussed scriptures today, that's just so clearly not the case, right? Um, I would feel like I was making the opposite, the same kind of error in the opposite direction if I were to say, no, the scriptures are just absolutely univocal on monogamy. They don't leave any sort of room for polygamy. Mm, I don't see that. I mean, Abraham, this is a tragic story, but who is Abraham? Well, in the New Testament, He's the father of the faithful. He's not just the progenitor of the Jews. He's like this model for the Christians. Now that doesn't, I'm not saying that means, this means Christians are supposed to practice polygamy or have a surrogate for the an infertile woman or, or whatever. I'm saying if polygamy was that bad, if polygamy was satanic or something, why is it that like the Old Testament role model for Christians in the letters of Paul is this guy who he wasn't, he's not a straight up monogamist or when, sure. when, God is, when God is choosing, similarly, when God is choosing the house of Israel, right now, now you, you talked about, and it's just the plainest thing in the world, like Jacob's sons, they're a freaking mess, right? They do the number of terrible things that they do is like, without question, right? And so it's not, the idea is not, well, they did these terrible things, so we should do them too, right? But the fact that Jacob's family was formed, like he has, why does he have the 12 sons that he has? Where do the 12 tribes of Israel come from? Right. They come from this polygamous marriage. So if polygamy is like this, like if it's like sort of the satanic counterfeit to God's true order of marriage, then God used a really funny way of producing his chosen people, like the, the 12 tribes in the first place. So, so that, that, and, and, and then I think like, well, if, if polygamy, again, if it's that bad, if it's like satanic, then I would expect that the Bible would have like explicit, like forbidding of polygamy. Sure. And so I just, I don't see sort of like I was saying earlier about the world is complex. There are contradictions in, in complexity and contradictions in scripture. I think it would be well, I, entirely oh, possible to make a case that monogamy is like the standard, but then like, but then there are these complexities regarding that I see regarding polygamy. So I don't see it as just like, well, it's the, the canon of scripture is all polygamous or the canon of scripture is all monogamous. I actually think that there's more complexity and even contradiction in it. That's that's how I see. Yeah, it. I think that's really fair. And I guess I guess I have a couple of thoughts. And it's it's um, um let me see the best way to approach it. Okay, so here are a couple of things. God deals with us in our cultures, right? Mm -hmm. God deals with us in our circumstances, yes. and none of us is perfect, right. right? The question is, how do we do in the circumstances we are given? Right. Right. And so God doesn't wait. Well, like if if we believe, I mean, I hear I hear you saying this about about Abraham and Jacob, but I find it fascinating that you're using it kind of to defend polygamy, especially we already we already said how that Abraham and Jacob have absolutely nothing in common with Brigham Young and Heber J. Grant and Jedediah Grant and John Taylor and Wilford Woodruff. Nothing is the same about their circumstances. Right. But in addition, Abraham and Jacob and Isaac all had slaves. 
Mm -hmm. right? That was their culture. And, um, and so I guess the question isn't, does that mean that God is cool with slavery? Or is the question, can we, can we hope that they were people who treated, that, that they were in that situation, in those circumstances? Did they do the best they could in those circumstances, right? So I would say Abraham was in this horrible circumstance where his they were childless. He was being given all of these promises about his posterity. In my reading of it, I imagine that Sarai was heartbroken, feeling like she was, you know, that was a woman's only worth. I think it would be hard. It's hard for women who want children today to not have them. In that day, that was her purpose. And she felt, you know, so it's very easy for me to see how suffering they were and how they were trying so hard to do their best mm. in these impossible mm. circumstances. This is what, I don't think there's a bad guy in the story. Mm. I think it's yeah, humans right. trying, right? right? And so- right. Um, It's a very and, human story. Yeah. Yes, it is. It is. And it's a, it's a, we should empathize, instead of blaming or abusing, we should empathize, right? And so I think that um, how Abraham navigated that human story that he had, mm -hmm. It tells us more about how God works with us. None of us can be free from the blood and sins of our generation. All of us have cultural taint on us, right? None of us can be can be perfect for what God wants us to be. Jacob was put in this horrible situation where his chosen wife, his the wife that he knew he was supposed to marry and who he was in love with, couldn't be his, right? And so and so people say, well, he chose to marry. Um, Rachel, yes, he did, because he was tricked into the right. situation and he suffered it. But do you know what he never did? He didn't exercise unrighteous dominion. He didn't glory in it. He didn't, right? Like, I think he navigated it incredibly well. And for me, that gives a lot of comfort to all of us that yeah. the circumstances of our lives may not be ideal. We may come from all different kinds of circumstances. All of us face them, right? How do we navigate them is the question. And so I, I, I like, like, for example, in, in Mormondom, I was always raised believing that our founding fathers were chosen by God, that it speaks of them in the Book of Mormon, that George Washington and others were righteous spirits, you know, preordained to do the things that they did. Yeah. They were born into the slave culture. But yeah. if you look at the writings of Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and others, how much they despised it and wanted a better system, but there wasn't an easy way out of it, right? right. They couldn't just free there. I mean, I don't want to get into difficult sure. situations right. that people haven't, I mean, difficult topics sure. that right. people haven't studied, but they were trapped in these awful situations. So the question is uh, like, like, for example, if, if a polygamist family today, you know, learned these things and read the scriptures and saw something different, the question isn't like, the question is, what do you do now that you know more? How do you navigate it now? How can you walk with God, right? right. And so, right. so that's what I think. That's how I would answer that question. I don't think we should look at that at all to say, oh, look, God's totally cool with polygamy. Because then we also have to say God's totally cool with slavery at the very least, including <laughs> sex slavery, right? Mm -hmm. And which which it's really troubling that Doctrine and Covenants, verse, section 132, verse 1, talks about the principle and doctrine of concubines, Mm -hmm. Especially when you consider that this was coming to a slave America. And mm -hmm. what would a concubine have been in America at that period? It would have been a slave that is that a master had sexual access to, right? Like, like anyway, so I so that's why I get a little mm -hmm. intense about it, just because it's mm -hmm. like these were incredibly good men navigating mm -hmm. their situation. So we should look at how they navigated their situation, not try to justify uh, ourselves in glorifying the hardest parts of their lives and saying right. that's how it should be. Right, 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 right. So, so people can look at and have looked at, like let's say the story of Jacob, uh, like in Ogden Kraut's book, like um, uh, Polygamy in the Bible, um, to say like, well, this is, this is how we're supposed to live. This is, they try to make a positive case for polygamy as like ideal using the story, which is actually a very tragic human mm -hmm. story, right? So that's not what I'm saying. That's not right. what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to make a positive case for polygamy. I do acknowledge, like you're saying that, like I was saying about Revelation itself, my view of it is it's like a divine human collaboration. Well, so is all of sacred history. So so like what's going on with the, the, the sacred figures in the Bible, like Abraham or Jacob or 
Peter and Paul or whoever, right, is a sort of divine human collaboration. These are human beings working with God, sort of doing their best and sometimes making mistakes and being influenced by their culture. And obviously we all, our culture is our starting point. It's the material we, it's sort of the pre-existing material that we create from necessarily because that's mm -hmm. what we have to work with. The same, the same is true for us as for them, right? And um, so my thought here is in addition to the obvious like human error, human suffering, human culture, I get curious like if polygamy, if we're saying theologically, well, not only is polygamy not like sort of the invariant divine standard and what you have to do to be exalted and these these biblical stories show it. If we're, and, and if instead of saying that, we're saying like the opposite, like monogamy is the invariant divine standard. Polygamy is this satanic um, counterfeit. Then why right. did, then, I, then what I want to know is not just why did Jacob end up with multiple wives, but why did God, because God, in the Bible and scripture is seen as an active agent in shaping human events. And so why, like, I don't know, if, if polygamy is so bad as to be like anti-God, like satanic, then why does God use a polygamous family to start his chosen nation of Israel, those 12 tribes? I mean, it's not like you're gonna have the same 12 children from like like one particular wife as you get from these four women like like genetically or and otherwise right and so I it's not it's not a I'm not saying it's it's not a positive argument for why people should practice polygamy I guess it's just pointing out like a sort of hesitation that I have in saying well it's sort of all monogamy all the time and everything else is of Satan. So could I respond? So a couple of a couple of thoughts. First of all, I, I definitely wouldn't say that. I mean, I wouldn't say polygamy is satanic because that implies that polygamists are all Satan worshipers or, you know, well, I, I would say that God established God way, God's way and then God's establishment is corrupt in this fallen world. Okay. But God's it's a corruption of God's established perfect form of marriage or God's establishment and commanded form of marriage. That's what I'd say. It's a corruption, okay. not necessarily a satanic, right? Okay. But I, I, and then a couple of things that I think are interesting. I think the reason that you're asking this and we're having this conversation is does stem from section 132 and Mormon polygamy, because mm -hmm. what I don't hear you saying is, well, like, like I don't hear you asking the same questions about slavery, for example. Right. And I don't think you would want to say, you know what, like slavery really, I, I'll t I will say this, polygamists, I, I'm sorry if I'm offending anyone, it's just true. Polygamists hold to all of Brigham Young's doctrines and defenders of polygamy that also elevate, because a lot of people in the LDS church still really defend polygamy. They also hold to Brigham's recent um, teachings on race and they're mm -hmm. extremely racist, right? And for some reason, our society has said, no, we're not okay with that. Our church has said, we're not okay with that. So most polygamists don't speak freely about their ideas on race, but they do still about their ideas on men and women and polygamy, right? right. So I guess I would say, do you have the same question about slavery because of Jacob and Abraham? Are you like, well, clearly God's okay with it because he chose them. Do well, okay. you get what I'm saying? Or sure. So, so I guess uh, that's a very good question and a very good point. So I guess, um, I mean, first I would say that clearly God's okay with it isn't something that I said, right? Like what I was oh, saying okay. was I'm sort of countering the idea that like polygamy, that I thought I heard in your anniversary episode when you were talking specifically, you raised it um, when you were talking initially about Lamech, and I thought you were generalizing it to say that polygamy is satanic. And so- I would say it's satanic in the same way that slavery is satanic. I, I just mean it's a corruption of what God established. And so you, so your point about um, like the wives, some of the wives being in, wives involved here. So, so the topic we've had under discussion was polygamy, not slavery, right? So obviously my mind has gone specifically yeah. analyzing the scriptures about polygamy, not addressing slavery as such. But you raise a good point that in this story, 
um, Bilhan Zilpa are handmaids, apparently slaves. I have not looked at the the underlying Hebrew, but presumably the meaning here is that they were slaves of Rachel and Leah. Um, and so uh, if that is part of how uh, Jacob's family is being formed, um, would we have to like um, condone or say slavery must not be that bad? That's, that's, a, that's a very good point. That may, I would maybe, before I'd say anything definitive, want to think it through more rather than say on the spot, but that, that may be an effective counter to okay. my reasoning that may be uh, on, on, the, on God's potential use of polygamy here to start Jacob's family, to start the house of Israel, because I, I decidedly don't think that slavery is or ever has been okay. I, I do understand that it, it was so prevalent, like you're saying, but I think that the idea of a human being owning another human being, like like having a slave, right, is simply reprehensible wherever it has occurred, even if there are cultures where it people just accepted it without question. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. I I, I think another thing, like I kind of want to take level it up just one point, that as I look at the stories of Abraham and Jacob. I don't see any more justification for claiming polygamy to be a highly a high order of God, a command than I do for slavery. Right. Mm -hmm. Like polyg it, these were unfortunate cultural practices. Right. Mm -hmm. That I think they've hopefully navigated very well. I believe Abraham was very good to his servants. I don't think he was a awful slave master. Right. However, it is it is interesting that the polygamists looked at their stories and said, we can use that to justify polygamy, right? And so that's why I think it's interesting that we're having this discussion. I think that they are equivalents because they're societal practices that were unfortunate. But um, I would say that from the stories, we know that Jacob and Abraham went into polygamy less willingly than they went into slavery, right? That was part of their culture. Mm -hmm. And um, and so anyway, I, I do think it's interesting that we like I said, try to elevate polygamy while not necessarily doing the same with slavery. However, Brigham Young did say, I want to say it was in 1852, January, maybe it was, I might have to check on that date, did say that he knew through, he knew that polyg that slavery was of God. Mm -hmm. So he also was a big advocate of slavery. He, we're talking about African-American slavery at this time in America. Mm -hmm. He's not talking, you know, he, he at least didn't take it to, it's the highly highest, holiest principle of the gospel and only men who own slaves or at least want to own slaves will be exalted, right? Which mm -hmm. is what he did with polygamy. So so yes, I appreciate that, that we can see the comparison between those two. And, and then I do think it's interesting, you are very familiar with the story of Judah and Tamar. Yes. And people yes. often will say, God chose Jesus to come through this line. This is the house of Israel. So again, we would have to do the same thing with prostitution. Mm -hmm. Right. And say, clearly, God wants us all to practice prostitution because that's the chosen line. Right. I, mm -hmm. That's that's how it looks to me. Sure, 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 sure. Now, I, I um, did not come today prepared with like a comprehensive list of biblical no. polygamists. My my impression looking at this years ago, not recently, was I did not get the sense that everyone in the Bible who was described as being polygamous was like a negative figure. Uh, my impression was that there were positive figures. I didn't see like divine commandments like prohibiting polygamy. And so because you have that practice, but not um, things prohibiting it. And it seemed like there were laws regulating it maybe in the law of Moses, but not prohibiting it. Like, Again, I'm not, you would be more yeah. up to date on different passages, but my point in all that would just be to say, like I was saying earlier, I don't see for myself, and I'm not here to make a case for the scriptures are like so in favor of polygamy or something. That's, I, I just wanted to dialogue about this and, and the things that you had discussed, what you're seeing in scripture and, and enter into a dialogue with that without trying to say, hey, I'm... Yeah setting up on everything about polygamy in the scriptures and I'm trying to make a case for something which I'm not. But I, 
my sense is that there that that like I said earlier that there isn't like a uniformity there it's the the scripture the canon isn't univocal on this that um, people could understand could have different understandings that there are complexities here where I think that it's much more clear is in the Book of Mormon specifically and you talked in that episode about um, was it Noah and Replicash? Was that who it was? You know what? And Replicash, uh huh. Yeah. Who mm -hmm. were like respectively like Nephite and Jaredite kings who had many wives and concubines, right? They're they're very negative figures in the Book of Mormon. Their polygamy and their whole character and reign as kings is presented in a very negative way. So the Book of Mormon does not provide us with any. Or argue, people might argue that the Bible presents us with role models who practice polygamy. No one can argue that the Book of Mormon is presenting us with role models who practice polygamy, right? right. And so then we come to the, the most, sort of the, by far the most targeted part of the Book of Mormon when it comes to polygamy, Jacob chapter two. And this like section of scripture just has like such a complex history and uh, of interpretation, right? And um, you laid out different things about, you know, the sort of the interrelationship of different parts of this passage, because it does start out talking about like, you know, um, how, you know, this people like begin to, uh, how it says that they err because they desire many wives and concubines like unto, you know, David and Solomon, his son. And then it says, you know, uh, it goes on to say that, you know, be something like, behold, David and Solomon truly had many wives and concubines, which thing was abominable before me, saith the Lord. And then it says, like, wherefore, like, I think it's talking about, it's the Lord has led this people out of the land of Jerusalem. So you drew the connection because there's a connecting word there. Wherefore, that meaning therefore, right? So it's saying like, well, David and Solomon practiced polygamy, well, then the therefore would indicate that Lehi's family being required to leave has something to do with the polygamy that had been practiced in Jerusalem that harks back to David and Solomon and so on. Um, so and then if you kind of like so, so um, a difficulty that we have in our use of scripture, of course, is proof texting where we just pull a passage out of its context and we just deploy it. Well, this passage says this. Well, no passage of scripture has its entire meaning contained just within a single verse. That verse is always part of a larger context, right? And so if, um, if we take a parable of Jesus where um, we have, there are parables of Jesus where he presents like negative figures, right? Like a, a debtor who has been forgiven by his creditor but won't forgive another debtor, right? So, so if we just quote the part where in, in that parable where the unforgiving debtor is speaking, we're not, we, we can't just quote that as, oh, here are the words of Jesus. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, like Yes, I, I'm very familiar with this entire. <laughs> yes. so, so there's a context. So um, well, I'm not, Michelle, I'm not saying you're not familiar with Oh, right. Sorry. I'm, Sorry. I'm, you're saying that for everyone. Well, yeah. Okay. Right. I'm trying to use this as a way of talking about Jacob too in ways that you are familiar with and that you were talking about. So I apologize. I, I'm, yeah. If that came You're across, as I'm talking down to you. No, like, no. I, it's, I'm actually trying to explain something surrounding what I see you doing with Jacob too in the episode is you're not proof texting. You're not just pulling a single verse out and saying, well, look, it says this, right? And so you rightly point out that... Um, uh, verse 30, which is used as the loophole for polygamy historically, the, the sort of proviso for polygamy, um, begins with the word for, right? So for, like wherefore, it's a connecting word. So it's connecting it back with what had just been said. Well, what had just been said was the commandments to have, but, you know, save it be one wife and, and no concubines, and then talking about the curses that would happen if they don't obey the Lord's commandments in the promised land. And so 
uh, you pointed out that that for is sometimes it's like actually replaced. It's either left out or it's just replaced with the word but, which but and for have an opposite relationship to what comes prior, right? The one it is saying, nevertheless, unless, but it, I've seen it replaced with any of number yeah, of those. Right. Mm -hmm. So for means I'm telling you this because of what I just said, but right. means I'm telling you this in spite of what I just said. Those are two entirely different relationships. They're opposite, opposite. relationships, mm -hmm. right? And so I actually, when I, I have a lengthy manuscript on this that I need to complete further and probably actually break into multiple articles where I've tried to do lengthy exegesis of Jacob 2, verse, particularly verse 30. And I do think that there are some, my word that I love here, complexities to be discussed surrounding it. I nonetheless think that if we're taking the passage in its textual context at face value, it doesn't mean what it has been deployed to mean traditionally in support of polygamy. So um, if, um, so in, in that passage, as you pointed out, you know, it says, for if I will say if the Lord of hosts raise up seen unto me, I will command my people Otherwise, they shall hearken unto these things. Well, so then the question is, what are the, what's the commandment and what's the things? And you pointed out that things earlier in that passage refers to the things which were written concerning David and Solomon, right? So, so shall hearken, and this is like, people might actually need to look at the passage in order to like, I don't know, for me, if I hear somebody talking about details of how to interpret a passage and I'm not looking at it, that can be kind of difficult. But like the... So in that passage where it says other, so, so the traditional interpretation, as you know, you know, because it's saying like, um, for if I will saith the Lord of hosts, uh, raise up soon to me, I would command my people. The assumption is I would command my people polygamy and that otherwise they shall hearken unto these things is taken to refer back to the commandments of monogamy that he had just given when actually things like earlier referred to the things written concerning David and Solomon, polygamy, Whereas what he had just commanded, which is the word used here, command, was monogamy, right? And so the, the most straightforward reading of verse 30 would be that it's reiterating what has just been said rather than opposing what had just been said and providing some kind of loophole against it, right? And so I think you pointed to uh, 1 Nephi 7, 1, where, you know, Lehi's family so the idea in this traditional polygamous interpretation of verse 30 is um, that God wasn't commanding Lehi's family to raise up seed unto him. Well, where are we getting that idea? Because in verse 23, it says he brought them out of Jerusalem to raise up a righteous branch to him. And in 1 Nephi 7.1, He's, it use, it's the only place in scripture, and this just heightens what you had said about it. It's the, actually the only place in scripture where the exact phrasing is used of verse 30, the, the raise up seed unto me or the, the Lord, right? Like that raise up seed unto the Lord is the language used in 1 Nephi 7, 1. And then raise up seed unto me is the language used in um, Jacob uh, 2.30. 2 and so if we're trying to understand one of these passages, surely we ought to look at the other because they're the only ones using this exact language, you know, raise, raise up seed unto God. And so the, the Nephites, Lehites had been commanded to raise up seed unto God in 1 Nephi 7, 1. And how were they commanded to do it? Well, they were sent back to get Ishmael's family, which had the exact number of daughters that each unattached male in Lehi's family needed in order to marry monogamously. So it looks for all the world here like seed is being raised up to God in the promised land by Lehi's family through monogamy. And so that, and so then the, um, so, so I'm agreeing with your interpretation that the, the, the most direct reading of this passage on its own internal logic would be that it's reinforcing the pro-monogamy um, message, not like contradicting it or trying to provide a loophole in it. Um, seems like I had another thought, but yeah.
Okay, well, maybe it'll come to you. That I, I really appreciate that. I so do you agree that Jacob two thirty is not a loophole that undermines the rest of Jacob's sermon? It's. I don't see it as a loophole. I think that the most straightforward reading, it would not be a loophole. I think that. I think that it's still and, and here's. Here's presumably where we wouldn't see this the same, right? But I do think that, so Latter-day Saints seem to have had the idea that Jacob II has to provide a loophole or there's no way there could be like polygamy in the restoration and that be okay. And uh, so I think that the argument that would need to be made when the details of Jacob II are actually looked at um, to figure out what it's trying to say on its own merits would be that even though there's not a loophole in the Book of Mormon, that people would believe that somehow polygamy was later divinely commanded, even though Jacob II doesn't give a loophole. So I'm saying I still see a way where someone could say polygamy is commanded, but I don't think that Jacob 2.30 read closely in its context provides a loophole for polygamy and I actually think that another actually think that there's further evidence that so so coming out as a historian as well as like a you know someone who studies scripture right i see evidence that the earliest latter day saints were not interpreting it as a loophole so i think that in that light of, of later polygamy the, the later polygamy becomes a lens through which we have read jacob 230 and so then it becomes difficult for us to see it any other way. If you know the, I'm sure you know the familiar thing that Stephen Covey showed of like the, the image that has actually like the old woman and the young woman in the same image. And then do you know what I'm talking about? Where mm -hmm. the, if people are primed by seeing an image of the young woman first, they, they will look at it and they can only see the young woman. They can't see the old woman. And if they've been primed with the image of the old woman, they can only see the old woman. And so they talk to each other and they think the others are crazy. What do you mean you see a young woman? I see this old, old woman. What do you see you mean you see an old woman? You know, like, and so right. um, we've been primed to see something. And so of course we see it. So then the question is, what is the text really saying on its own merits when we look at it up close? Um, and then there's a question historically, what did the earliest Latter-day Saints see when they looked at it? Because I think the assumption has been, this gets translated by Joseph Smith and everybody's thinking, well, God's against polygamy, but this is saying, unless he wants to raise up seed to him, then he'll command it. Um, was that how they were reading it? So I see reason to believe that they weren't reading it that way, at least, at least some of them. I obviously can't say, we don't have records from like, the thousands of people encountered the Book of Mormon saying how they read this passage. But I do think we have indication that Hiram Smith did not read it this way. And you will be familiar with this journal entry. So Levi Richard's journal, May 14, 1843, um, he records notes of a sermon that Hiram gave at the temple that day right, and Hiram was up in arms, he's hearing rumors about polygamy, and he's trying to put them down, and he's quoting the Book of Mormon, right, and he says, um, there were a great many that had a great deal, there were many that had a great deal to say about the ancient order of things as David and Solomon and David having many wives and concubines, that is an abomination in the sight of God. If an angel from heaven should come and preach such doctrine, some would be sure to see his cloven foot and cloud of darkness over his head, those garments sh might shine uh, white as snow. A man might have one concub uh, one wife, but concubines he should have none. He observed the idea that this was given to Jacob for a perpetual principle. Okay, so what I'm seeing in what Hiram Smith is saying. So imagine that Hiram Smith is already familiar with the idea by this point that Jacob two thirty is a loophole for polygamy. Okay, imagine that he thought that Jacob two thirty says if God commands polygamy, if God wants to raise up seed to himself, then he'll command polygamy, so then polygamy is okay. Well, what he actually says in the sermon is that if an angel came and taught that, it would be a, a fallen angel. It would be a false angel. So, but the idea of an angel coming and teaching it is that God commands it. 
right? So if Hiram thinks that there's a loophole for God commanding it, why isn't that coming through in his sermon? Why is he saying instead, well, God wouldn't command that. That would only be a false, if God wouldn't send an angel to command that, that would only be a false angel, right? And then when he says that this principle, this what Jacob is saying about polygamy, that a man should have one wife and no concubines, was given for a perpetual principle, he means that's permanent. Mm -hmm. What's permanent, he's not thinking that there's a loophole. Right. Thing. It doesn't make sense for him to hold the ideas in mind. Well, I see that Jacob gives this massive loophole for divinely commanded polygamy, but it was a perpetual principle. We're always supposed to do monogamy. Those don't go together. So what I'm seeing is evidence that prior to people like having embraced like Mormon polygamy, they're not seeing Jacob 2.30 as a loophole. At least Hiram wasn't. Okay. And, right. And so, <clears throat> and so that would potentially go along with what you and I have both been doing here in terms of like reading Jacob 2 based on the internal relationships within the text rather than, you know, it taking the tradition of interpretation that uses it as a polygamy loophole. I think that the text is most straightforwardly read as not providing loophole for polygamy, which again, doesn't mean polygamy could never be commanded, but it does mean Jacob's not opening any kind of loophole like that at all. He seems, to, if anything, you would think he's doing the opposite, right? And okay. then early, earliest Latter-day Saints are not, they don't seem to be reading it, doesn't look to me in this case, certainly like they're reading it that way either. That all needs to be taken into account in trying to correctly interpret this, passage so when it comes to all these things i'm i'm open right to like um so so just because i think that just smith did teach and practice polygamy doesn't mean that i want to take each source and like try to interpret it in a way that like supports polygamy or something here we have a text that i look at it this text i look at it and i see an anti-polygamy text right and so um, I accept that. And, and like I said, I, I will get into some sort of complexities related to it and kind of like these larger papers when I get those published. Um, but I'm, I'm comfortable with the idea that like the Book of Mormon does not have a kind of loophole for, is not presenting a kind of loophole for divinely commanded polygamy. Okay, I appreciate you bringing up Hiram's sermon. I think that's a really valuable source. Did you say that's May 13th, 1843? It's May 14th, let me see. I, I, I have it in my files, but I didn't want to bring it up while you were talking. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, I had it up and then it looks like I okay. closed the... Well, was it 1843 in any case? It was 1843. And, and one thing I think is really interesting, so... So I appreciate you saying that because it does look to me like Orson Pratt was the main scriptorian who was charged by Brigham Young to justify polygamy in the scriptures. He's the one that presented it. He's the one that, you know, they were doing this for political reasons, too. And Orson Pratt went out to Washington, D.C. to preach that they should have religious freedom to pursue polygamy. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, and so so I think that's really interesting. And I do think it appears to me very much that he was proof texting to try to find justification for polygamy. And that's how he dealt with Jacob, chap, Jacob's sermon, because he doesn't say anything about King Noah or Replicus. He just ignores yeah. those. He just has to find so, some way to yeah. undermine the Book of Mormon. So I don't think Orson Pratt comes up with it originally. That okay. meaning, um so, because I have an 1844 source shortly after Joseph dies is from Joseph's brother, William. I, the William where, Smith one is com complicated, though. I, I couldn't date that for certain. And, it, it, and it, coming from that, it's, it's complicated. It is very, it's very complicated. It's it, admittedly, it's very complicated. So I guess I um, meant the first time I can nail it down for okay, sure. Right. Seems to so, be so, you, so for whatever it's worth, um, I think you're, you're probably familiar with this. I'm probably very familiar with this, but like um, Mary Elizabeth Rollins Leitner in one of her accounts about conversations with Joseph Smith and polygamy, she says that when Joseph was first commanded to practice polygamy by the angel with the drawn sword, that 
he argues with the angel using Jacob too. Um, right. So, uh, can, so you, we, can you just remind me what year that was written roughly? So this would be late. This would be very late. And I so I wanted to clarify that. So I think it might be around 1880. She left accounts as late as like 1912 or something. She was she the was, longest lived of the yes, women who were identified as Joseph Smith's plural wives. Um, so yeah, I, 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 that's why I'm, I'm just saying for, for whatever it's worth. But even in that account, notice something interesting. He notice did. that it assumes, okay, okay. So what the what the angel is supposed to reply next in her account is yes, but it says in that passage, for if I will say, if the Lord uh, raise up seed unto me, I will command my people. Okay, and and God is commanding you. So it's actually putting that interpretation on the lips of the angel. But if Joseph Smith had already had that interpretation, right. kind of like in a parallel to the Hiram situation, if Joseph Smith had already seen uh, polygamy. Jacob 2.30 as a loophole for polygamy, why would there be an idea that he would be, why wouldn't he just respond to the angel by saying, well, I guess God's commanding it, just like it says in that loophole in verse 30, right? So even in Mary Elizabeth Rollins Leitner's account, it actually seems to assume that prior to the introduction of Mormon polygamy, this passage was not being read as a loophole for polygamy. It's read as a loophole in retrospect Right. Not in prospect, not beforehand. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 I appreciate that. And the, the, the reason I wanted to ask about the year of the Hiram sermon is because according to Brigham Young, he's the only source to tell us when Hiram accepted polygamy. And do you recall the date that Hiram accepted polygamy? I think it, it's. So, so I recall that William Clayton's journal says something like, Hiram accepted the doctrine of the priesthood, which is under, has been understood to be polygamy. And then it's like May 20th or something. So it would be actually immediately after the sermon. Right, right. What, so I, know what Brigham, I, what I, remember that, I remember there was some dating information from Brigham, but I don't remember specifically, do you? Yeah, I think it was right around the time of this sermon. Like it, my, yeah. the, 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 how it looked to me is like, they have to find a way to make this all fit together, right? Mm -hmm. So, according to our narrative right now, so I appreciate that you are that you are really looking at Jacob, Jacob's and the entire Book of Mormon in context. That's really refreshing. Thank you so much. You know, mm -hmm. so but that makes it a challenge to have our standard narrative in the church that we've now uh, come to. You know, it changes over time, but the standard narrative now that's used is that. Monogamy is the rule, except when there's an exception and God commands us it for God's own reasons that that we don't fully understand. But, you know, that's kind of how they talk about it now, for the most part. Yeah. I mean, Brian Hills has come up with his four reasons, but they disagree with other yeah. people's reasons and they all disagree with yeah. Orson Pratt's reasons. And, you know, yeah. and so anyway, so the thing I find interesting is that we have Hiram giving this sermon and then we have Brigham Young being the source of saying that he was, you know, they were sitting out and Hiram came up to him and said, I, there's something that you know that I don't know. And Brigham yeah. says, oh, I'll tell you. And, you know, and then he, he says, I will only tell you if you promise you will never say another word against Joseph Smith. And this, of course, is what in the 1860s that Brigham is saying, this may be the 1850s, I can't remember which case is which. Brigham told a lot of stories. But this is what I find interesting is that, again, the historical record, well, and then I should finish the story that, he Brigham explained it all to Hiram because, you know, Joseph couldn't have possibly helped him under made him understand. It took Brigham to make Hiram understand. Mm -hmm. And he wept like a child and he covenanted with Brigham right then and there that he would never say another word against Joseph Smith. And then he went to Joseph and repented to him and made the same covenant with him. And then they went arm in arm, hand in hand to their graves, you know. So so I think this is what's fascinating is that we have these stories of Brigham just saying these things, which he did repeatedly like saying that emma tried to poison joseph twice and it yeah. goes on and on and on and we just accept them and believe them yeah. and we have this record that we can look at in levi richard's contemporaneous journal and see what hiram actually taught but we throw it out and say yeah hiram taught that one day but the next week brigham convinced him and so then he told that, that so i'm i'm not i'm not asking you to respond oh, i'm just I'm just explaining to you how it looks yeah. to me, why I think one model is far superior to oh, okay. another model. Sure, 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 sure. sure. So, it makes sense. And so, you know, like, 
like you know that I love to say, and like I said in our um, earlier episode on historical method, like like um, much of history is just getting the events in the right order, right? And then we see the story emerge. And so to me, like, and I, I acknowledge my fallibility in understanding things and that my own understandings will change and evolve with time and hopefully change in the direction of being more refined and being more accurate, right? But like the way that I am seeing this is that the, um, because I do think Joseph is practicing polygamy. So in that account, um, Brigham says that Hiram says basically something like, I've long suspected that Joseph is practicing polygamy, right? Um, the, um, when Hiram references an angel, that suggests he may be hearing a story of an angel commanding polygamy. There's also an allusion to that in one of the Bennett like accounts, right, in 42. Um, so if there's already a story circulating that polygamy is being commanded by an angel, um, uh, as we hear in the later accounts, um, Hiram may actually be responding to those circulating stories. And then um, I, I think that what's going on is that things come to a head on this issue with Hiram because Hiram is now ramping up the public opposition to polygamy. And so then there have to be internal conversations where Hiram is taught polygamy and then his acceptance of it. Uh, I don't think it's coincidence that we have Hiram making his th this blatant public statement against polygamy. And then we have the reports that right after this, he accepts polygamy. I think that that's what brings it to a head. And obviously there, there are different models here. There are different like ways of like, can, like taking the puzzle pieces and maybe organizing them right into a narrative. No, nobody has all the puzzle pieces, right? So we try to put the puzzle pieces together in the way that makes the most sense of things. And that's not gonna be just by looking at these particular puzzle pieces about Hiram and so on. It's gonna be the larger set of puzzle pieces, um, of course, that, you know, about Joseph and polygamy and, you know, what what might indicate that he did or didn't practice it that are going to, that, that larger model is going to provide more of the basis for interpreting specific events like the Sure, sure, and I'm open for that. I, I guess from my perspective, when I read Brigham Young's version of Hiram, Hiram's mm -hmm. an idiot. Mm -hmm. Brigham Young does like constantly talks about Hiram being kind of an idiot. He, you know, he, mm -hmm. he doesn't have a high he, reading in my opinion, Brigham and William Clayton's version of Hiram, Hiram's kind of dumb. Right. And so, but when I read Hiram's actual words, He's highly intelligent, mm. spot on, insightful, very brilliant. He was setting traps for the polygamists at this mm -hmm. point, right before this, right? Talking mm -hmm. about it, calling. Anyway, so so I what I find interesting is that Brigham said something to Hiram that made him understand it so well that he wept like a child and then said to Joseph, it's so plain. The doctrine is so plain. If you just write it down, I know I can convince Emma. And what we get is 132. Mm -hmm. That's laying out the doctrine so plain that anyone could understand it, right? Mm -hmm. And then and then Hiram's like, oh, look, it threatens her with destruction. She's just going to love this. I'm going to march my little self right down to her house where she's busy taking care of Lucy and all of the children. And I'm going to read this to her, mm -hmm. right? And that's going to really convince her. And, and then we'll, our relationship will be so good after that that she'll name her unborn child at the time of my death after me, mm -hmm. David Hiram Smith, right? Mm -hmm. I guess that's why mm -hmm. I'm looking at this story mm -hmm. going, it's dumb. Like, like, so, so and I don't mean to put you on the spot and I really appreciate you talking to me. I just, I'm kind of trying to share how I see this now. So let me ask you this question. Don Bradley, <laughs> in your heart of hearts, do you believe that an angel came to Joseph Smith with a drawn sword, sword threatening to basically decapitate him if he didn't cheat on his wife? And Joseph said, but look, look, the scriptures say I don't have to. And he says, now, Joseph, I'm commanding you. You better go sleep with the 14 year old or the 17 year old or not sleep with whatever excuse we want to make or else. 
do you believe that that is a valid, like the source on that, does that sound true to you in your heart of hearts? If you kind of just pray and ask God, what do you think of that story? Okay, so not to put me on the spot, right? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and if you don't want to answer, you don't have to answer. I that in fact, let's just move on because that's just a yeah, hypothetical well, to say let where my let me maybe say something sort of surrounding that because okay. I actually I do have work that directly relates to the angel with the drawn sword narrative and relates to and I still think we should call it flaming because there are several sources. No matter how Brian tries to undermine them, they, we do also have a flaming sword. So okay. anyway, go ahead. Yeah. I like the flaming sword better. <laughs> it's it's um, definitely be more motivating, right? But, well, I don't um, know. I mean, you're going to be decapitated either way. It's blood atonement. <laughs> be more intimidating. How about that? Um, so, um, yeah, so I do have... Um, research that I've done where I've tried to line up different events in Nauvoo to understand how polygamy unfolds. Um, there, the narrative, the way that I'm, and this, this would be like I'm presenting, I'm scheduled to present at the Mormon History Association conference on some of this, and then I'm working on a couple things to submit to the Journal of Mormon History. So this, rather than something that I would lay out in podcast form at this point, might be something that okay. I would lay out in future podcasts after it's in print, right? But like, but but sort of maybe the um, part of it would be, um, I actually think that even taking the perspective that I do, that Joseph Smith did introduce polygamy, I think there are a lot of surprises in the narrative that comes together from looking at the sources that are not the traditional version of the story. I think that I see where the angel with the drawn sword narrative, what I think I see an actual event from which it emerges I think that the event is more complicated than like a physical, like resurrected angel with an actual sword coming and making threats to Joseph Smith. Um, and yes, that story sounds the way that it's literally presented sounds very strange, disturbing, right? Fantastical. Like, I, yeah. Okay. So, so I, um, and I also think that what well I do very much think Joseph Smith initiates polygamy in Nauvoo. I also think, and this is not something that I have heard from other historians to this point, but it will be in these um, this conference presentation, these couple papers. I do think that actually Brigham Young has a substantial influence on the form that polygamy takes during Joseph Smith's lifetime, that polygamy actually evolves during Joseph's lifetime. And so I think that to that, while I do, again, very much think Joseph Smith institutes Mormon polygamy, I also think that part of the way he institutes it is different <laughs> and I then has been understood. And I think that Brigham plays a role in how it evolves, which people might see as positive or negative, depending on their viewpoint on Brigham Young and on how how the changes that come into Mormon polygamy. But I, I guess sort of my, it, it would be insufficient, I know, vastly insufficient to satisfy people who are skeptical that Joseph Smith started polygamy, but sort of my, one of my, one of, one of multiple nods or sort of hat tips that I can make um, uh, to those skeptical that Joseph Smith started polygamy and who think that Brigham Young started it um, is that they're not wrong that Brigham had a larger influence on the practice than has been understood in the past. Um, and so um, I know that's cryptic for me to say, but I, okay. yeah, this well, is not well, something well, I want to try to lay on podcast form before it's published. So, so I do think that there's such room for 
productive dialogue between people of different vantage points because once I came to see what I'm describing, what I'm alluding to seeing now, I thought, oh, I had just dismissed the people saying, well, Brigham Young starts, started polygamy um, without sort of any, um, like, like maybe taking into account possibilities for how Brigham may have been involved in ways that we haven't traditionally thought in that process. And so again, this is probably going to satisfy no one um, on any side, but, but I do think that the emergence of Nauvoo polygamy, I think it's initiated by Joseph. I also think that Joseph is not the only player in how it evolves. And I think that Joseph's, I, I also think that Joseph's initial version of polygamy was intended to be more egalitarian. And I think that, um, and this will be, and all these things will be in these like probably two papers. Um, I also think that when Joseph and others in Nauvoo were looking back at the biblical stories of people like Jacob, that they actually saw appalling things in those stories that they did not want to restore, but that they wanted to correct. And so I think that they were in some ways attempting to come up with a form of polygamy that didn't have all these problematic aspects. I think there was an attempt to be more moral and ethical and not just take random practices from the Bible and restore them regardless of their merits and just bring them back in their original problematic forms. And so I know that's all like a, a bunch of stuff for me to say that's this, well, this is something that I'll be publishing out into the future. But I, but I guess I want to say all that just to say that like, as a historian, I, in saying that I think Joseph Smith practiced polygamy, I'm not saying, oh, the standard story is just, it's just 100% right. We know it's just always been told exactly right. We know that Joseph did this and the angel said that and this happened and, you know, it's, it's, uh, and Joseph started polygamy in exactly the way that it ends up being practiced and, and, and so on um, in Utah. Okay. So I don't, I want to say, I, I want to acknowledge that there are complexities here and that I'm not trying to defend a traditional story. I, I, I want in my way, I just want to know what happened. And if, you know, if we come to different conclusions on that temporarily, hopefully there's some point out on the horizon where those trajectories converge out in the future and we're at least closer together in our understandings. And maybe that won't happen, but in any case, I think uh, we can still be friends. We can still be fellow saints. We can still have productive dialogues on all of this. Okay, that's fantastic. So what I'm hearing you say is that you have now developed a hybrid model that like you've taken into consideration um, some of the polygamy denier arguments and considered some of the weaknesses of the standard narrative arguments and have seen a new possibility that brings both together a little bit more. I, I think and, I think you could say yes, it would it would be at least a little bit more of a convergence between the two models. There would still be substantial disagreement, sure. but but the idea that yeah, Joseph Smith is the only mind behind the way that it, it's only him thinking about polygamy that leads to the form that Mormon polygamy takes. It's nothing of anybody else like Brigham Young. I don't think that's correct. Okay. And I, I think that there's a sort of dialogue, that there's a sort of mutual influence among different people, not just, it's not just a one man show of Joseph Smith doing all these things. Okay, okay, this is really helpful to understand. So a couple of quick questions. Sure. So um, so I guess since we are arguing on two fronts, right? There's the standard right. narrative. It sounds to me like you're kind of saying, yeah, the standard narrative is not comprehend, it's not completed, it ignores too many sources. We need to rethink yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Like for example, I'm assuming maybe some of the um, letters and journals in England in 1841 and right, Maybe that's one of the things you're taking into consideration. Well, Heber, Heber Brigham, and Brigham and Clayton. Brigham says that he had polygamy revealed to him in England. Yes. So then right. what I wonder is what form did that polygamy take? Like what, when he talks about polygamy, he had to have an image in mind of that. It's not just like the 
I, I doubt that it's just like the word polygamy popped into his mind or something. He had some concept of polygamy. What does what does po lived polygamy have you, look like? Have you looked into the Cochranite connection? And so, have you read I, the, I, the letters and journals from England to get a sense of what that may be? It looked a little bit more, in my estimation, like spiritual wifery, which is what they called it. So, so I am, okay. It has, I have not recently looked okay. at the Cochranites. I had looked at the Cochranites sometime several years back. And I see the Cochranites as part of the larger milieu yes, of the uh -huh. era regarding polygamy. There's actually a book, Polygamy and Early American History, Sarah Pearsall. She gives a history of polygamy in the United States back from like the like the 1700s and 1800s. Okay. And so I actually think that this is, people coming from all sides of this question would probably benefit from looking at That's more great. of a larger milieu regarding polygamy in the United States at the time, like the Cochranites, which early Latter-day Saint missionaries like Orson Hyde and others did encounter, um, and who were practicing like sp having spiritual wives and so on. Um, I think all of that is relevant context for understanding the rise of Mormon polygamy. Now, I don't, I, in saying that, I'm not subscribing to the idea that like, well, the apostles went out and encountered the Cochranites and they introduced polygamy because that's not the, that's not the perspective that I'm taking. But nonetheless, I do think that we need to understand that larger context if we're going to understand Mm -hmm. Latter-day Saint, so Mormon just, polygamy in its context, yeah. So I don't want to open more rabbit holes. I'm just <clears throat> curious, do you reject the story of Augusta Cobb, Marion Brigham, that from the... So so remind me. Um, Augusta Cobb, my understanding, and I have a little... Oh, that it was very about, early? Is she, was, she was with the Cochranites, left, oh. I think, her husband and seven children or something, Yeah. and came with Brigham Young, and oh. there's tricky stuff there right so and then and then brigham did like they were i think there's very strong evidence that they were doing some sort of spiritual marriage something in england and so anyway I, I, we don't have to get into it I now watched, i'm just curious i watched some i watched something you did was it did you have you had conversations about the the england about, yeah jeremy hoop came on and we talked jeremy. about the england um so uh, yeah, I did watch that, and I, I don't have it very fresh in my mind right now. Okay, I, okay, we could. I do. I I remember thinking, yes, there's clearly something interesting going on in those journals. I didn't, I didn't see it as reflecting something polygamy like, but I, okay. but it was, it definitely is something that calls out for explanation. What are they talking about? So I'm, I'm intrigued okay. with it, right? And I, um, yeah. Okay. Well, okay. This is, this is good to hear because what I'm, how I'm interpreting this and you would, I know you wouldn't want it stated this um, abruptly, but what I'm hearing is that you are somewhat rejecting the, his, the standard narrative and saying it's insufficient. It ignores too many things. So you're coming up with a new proposed hybrid model is how I would describe it saying Brigham and Joseph working together. I am, I did have one more question that I just wanted to ask, which is um, so the, you know, the Mormon perspective is more the angel with a drawn sword. That's kind mm -hmm. of the Brian Hales model. The anti-Mormon perspective is the like libido driven Joseph coming up right. with stories about angels mm -hmm. with a drawn sword. Um, if you had to like, where, where are you on that um, spectrum? Okay. Yeah. So um, this would get into deeper issues regarding my view of Joseph Smith himself. That I so, so I'm gonna struggle to characterize here. Um, I I see polygamy as something that is actually in some ways sort of part of Joseph Smith's prophetic practice. That um, I think that he understands that in various ways it's actually important for him to practice it in order to fulfill his role as a prophet. And I know some of this, I, I, there's a lot that actually what I should be doing a lot is much more writing and publishing because I have so many things that I have seen in the data that I haven't gotten out. And so then that 
it makes it harder because there's such detailed arguments from the sources. It makes it difficult to make like blanket statements on something like a podcast when I'm behind yeah. on what I should have already published. Right. So and just so you know, I'm coming from the exact same perspective. I feel like I should have written things out, but I feel like okay. the value of discourse, because we're not setting out finalized conclusions. We're inviting people into the, the, the research, into the study, sure. right? We're yeah. trying to figure it out. Oh. So, so I don't want you to feel like you're anything is set in stone. I just, I understand that both so, of us are still learning. Yeah. So some of this might sound offhand. It might sound crazy, particularly for listeners of this podcast who are skeptical that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy at all. Right. But just to put out like things that I, what I'm perceiving in the data, right. And will eventually be publishing. So I would say that um, I, I know you've talked a lot about levered marriage and, and sort of critical ways that are critical of levered marriage and how it's been used in like Mormon polygamy discourse. I did an episode um, on it. Yes. Yeah. So I think that um, I actually think in some cases, Joseph Smith is doing like a polygamous levered marriage and that the intention is actually to, um, and I, again, I know this might sound crazy um, to sort of make a connection with someone through the veil, like the deceased husband, the woman's deceased husband. Okay. So kind of like, if you think about baptism for the dead, um, in first Corinthians, it uses the phrase baptism for the dead, but it doesn't actually lay out a description of a practice of proxy baptism. So where in the canon of scripture before the introduction of Latter-day Saint baptism for the dead is the idea of proxy work for the dead introduced that, a living person can do for a dead person what the dead person can't do for themselves. Leveret marriage is actually okay. the best model of that, right? Because a, a man can't procreate when he's dead, but if his brother does it for him, that's by proxy, right? So I actually think that Joseph's contemplation of like proxy ordinance work in Nauvoo is, I think that part of what he's thinking through is things like proxy concepts in scripture, like with Leverett marriage. And then I think that in his polygamy that sometimes this kind of idea comes into play. There's a, an attempt to connect with someone through the veil. I also think that many of the women who reportedly married him actually are women who were impressive in a variety of ways. They had really deep spiritual experiences. And so I look at Joseph's polygamy and I don't see him trying to choose like Navu's hottest babes or whatever, right? That that it's like driven by sex. I actually think that the reason for the choice of some of the specific women is precisely because of their sort of spiritual qualifications. So I see him looking for sort of co-workers in what he's doing rather than trying to amass a sexual harem. And so um, again, I know that without without yeah, I appreciate you spelling it out without any sort of detailed like analysis of sources or laying it out that this may sound like just wing nut ideas. And so I wouldn't be at all offended if people just dismiss this, but, but since you asked, right. Yes. These are some of the things that I'm understanding about Joseph Smith and polygamy. And so I don't, is it like a, a resurrected, being standing bodily before Joseph Smith with an actual sword threatening to cut him down at that moment. No, I, I don't think so. Right. And I will have, like I said, further publication that will go into that very specifically what I would argue did happen. Okay. And that story and to argue that story is coming from somewhere, but if it can be taken much too literally. Um, and then on the other hand, I don't think that this is something that's driven by Joseph's libido. And I used to think that. That okay. was my perspective for a long time. And then the more I got into analyzing the data and the more I got into looking at him, the, the, the person and what's motivating him more generally, I see someone who like he's looking at the world around him. He, he believes like it says in DNC 59 um, or 58 that like against none is the Lord's wrath kindled to save those who keep uh, not his commandments and acknowledge not his hand in all things. I think Joseph Smith acknowledges hand, God's hand in all things. He looks for signs of divine providence in the world around him. He realizes God is the creator of the world. And so God might actually put things in our lives to teach us. 
And so I think I see Joseph, I see certain events happening in his life. And suddenly Joseph like changes direction based on this event because he's looking and he's saying, oh, God is telling me something through this event. And so I, I see his concept of revelation as a much more expansive concept that includes not only like visions and voice in the mind or whatever, but also interpreting spiritually, interpreting like day-to-day -day events and so on. And so then this factors into my understanding of how he practices his, his polygamy because I see him when I line up the events and I say, well, this event happened and then this is the marriage date that's given for him marrying a certain woman. Hmm, that doesn't seem coincidental. These two things seem related. I'm thinking, you know, this event is something he's interpreting as part of God telling him that he needs to be sealed to this woman or whatever. And so, um, and, and so do you see what I'm saying that that's kind of, I think as sort of a middle ground position where I'm not saying, I don't think he's sexually motivated or that that's where polygamy is coming from. I mean, any marriage system, sex is involved, right? If it's an actual marriage system. So in monogamy, people's choice of a marriage partner, like, like sexual attraction. Absolutely. Oh, why, why wouldn't it play? It why should, it ideally. No role in polygamy, right? So I'm not saying it doesn't play a role, but I don't see it as the initiating factor in Joseph's polygamy. I do see him as being on a much higher level than that, that he has spiritual aims that he's seeking, but it's not this, but it's not the literal angel standing there with the literal sword ready to literally kill him. And it's not the, on the one hand, it's not the sexual libertine on the other. It's a much more complex historical character. Okay. Okay. This is, this is really interesting. So if I'm interpreting correctly, it sounds to me like you're kind of building on the presentation you did on leveret marriage. It's kind of, maybe that's a foundation that you're going to expand and, and modify. Um, is that, so? because I was thinking I could go ahead and link that presentation below because you did address leveret sure. marriage in Joseph's view of polygamy in that so presentation. I, I, I addressed it in a, yeah, in a really simple way. Right. And, yeah. and, and so, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And okay. um, the, right. You, no, so if I give everyone the caveat. Right that that's related. You're right that that's related in my mind. And then, um, and then I'm looking at other later things that happen that are actually reported incidents of polygamy, where it's arguably a leveret. The intention is a leveret marriage. And yeah, that's what I'm hearing it through that sort of framework. Yeah. Okay, so I'll go ahead and link below your presentation. And then I'll also link my episode I did on Leverett Marriage. And I know I was just a little bit hard on, on you. It wasn't just your punchline. I don't think you've watched the episode. I, I actually very much disagree that Joseph's marriages have anything to do with Leverett Marriage. Th those are the ideas that I, that right. I disagree so, with. So, but right. I think it, I, but it's an interesting thing to consider and to discuss. Sure. So so in that, what I, what I saw in that episode was that... Um, you had used like the punchline and such, but then you didn't include any of the framing of why was I raising this question in the first place, which had to do with like, that we had different people saying that Joseph and Emma's first child, the one who died, right? Who was Alvin. apparently the first uh -huh, baby, Alvin, yeah. that he was going to actually possess the plates. He was supposed to be able to read the sealed portion. He was supposed to come into possession of the sort of Laban. We have people saying that in Emma's mm -hmm. family. We have people saying that up in Palmyra. We have such a wide spread of people saying that it, it seems like it's something that Joseph was actually saying. So then what, what got me thinking about this was, why does he think this? Why does he yeah. think this? And then the Leverett marriage connection with Alvin was something that came out of that. So I wasn't, e even if people see that interpretation as too speculative, I wasn't like literally drawing that from nowhere. There's a particular historical problem I was trying to solve. And this is where I went in trying to solve sure. that. Problem. And that's why I will tell people this. I will say this. Please watch Don's presentation first. And then, and then if you want to watch my episode on Leverett Marriage, you're not the only source I talk about. You're just so, one right. of many. Right, right, right. And I will, I will say right now, if I was at all, I can't remember it, but if, it, if I was at all harsh or flippant or unfair, I apologize. Please listen to Don's first. Like, I apologize, Don, if I was. I would need to watch it again. I just, I, I tend And I don't remember it well enough to know. I, I remember yeah. at the time I thought, oh, I didn't feel 
like that really represented why okay. I was on this conclusion. That was well. Awesome. Thank you for forgiving me. <laughs> if, okay. if it sounds, I mean, we could be friends, and I'll link it below because well, I do think it plays yeah. into what you're developing now. Yeah. I think those ideas yes. are present in your model, so I yeah. think that'd be an you're interesting. Right. You're right. place but my gosh we have talked for hours and i thought it's been <laughs> phenomenal i i am i really liked this conversation i really appreciate exactly. this was more the theological and i'm i guess yeah. in the next one we'll get more into the historical exactly yes. and, and um and so anyway thank you don this was awesome i'm really glad we're doing this and i really appreciate it i i love it michelle thank you again so much for having me on your show multiple times and that we're able to really have a truly open dialogue. And there's, you know, um, I mean, we were at different perspectives here, but there's a kind of spirit of collaboration. And yeah. I, I, I thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you to all of you who stuck around to the end of this conversation. And another massive thank you to Don. I really am just so excited about this collaboration that we have going on and how we are able to both learn from each other and move this knowledge forward. I really appreciate the way that he engages. I think both of us are just looking for truth and discourse is a great way to find it. So thank you again for being here. Thank you, Don, and I will see you next time. <laughs>